Um, I'm calling to order this December 22nd. Ooh, every time they do that, I lose my screen. Uh, December 22nd, a town council meeting. Everybody could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance in a quick moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible. liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Hey, thank you all for joining. Got a pretty good crowd tonight. Uh, that gets us up to number four, proclamations and presentations, of which we have none. Um, number five is, oh, I didn't get my page open here. Number five is um, public participation communication um, on any subject within the jurisdiction of the town council with a two minute limit. Um, if you are on a device and you go to participants, you can raise your, um, your blue hand and we will call on you in order on which your hands come up. If you are on the phone, it is star nine and the same thing will happen. Let's see, 20 minutes, here we go. All right, uh, Kim. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Kim Little and I live at 16 Carter Drive. Um, and I'm here tonight representing the Tallinn Greater Together Community Fund. Um, this fund uh, is pleased to announce, announce a competitive grant opportunity offering multiple nonprofits a minimum grant award of $250 and a maximum grant award of $5,000, up to a total of $10,000 for the fund's first granting cycle. Proposed projects might benefit, must, I'm sorry, must benefit the residents of Tolland. All interested participants must complete the application. The application can be found at hfpg.org backslash town cf. Applications will, must be submitted by Monday, February 15th. Some background information. In 2019, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving established a $100,000 community fund for each of 29 towns in the foundation's region, which includes the town of Tolland. The purpose of Tolland's community fund is to support residents in taking ownership around the needs in their towns and encourage board broad and inclusive civic engagement. In 2020, Tallinn's Community Fund Advisory Committee was selected. The list of members and contact information are also found at hfpg.org backslash cf. Any nonprofit registered as a 501c3 organization that serves the residents of Tolland is eligible to apply. Groups of town residents may prepare an application in partnership with a registered nonprofit that has agreed to serve as a fiscal agent for the proposed project. Individuals and for-profit businesses are not eligible to apply Civic organizations that do not have a 501c3 IRS designation are not el eligible to apply. Applicants will be asked for, they must describe why this project is needed, describe the expected benefit, both who will benefit and for how long, describe why the applicant is well suited to implement this project. Explain what the project will cost. Also, some dates that are really important coming up um, are actually our, our, our application is open tomorrow. Um, and like I said, the grants will be, um, the final date will be February 15th. Um, applicants would be notified of our decision by March 22nd. 
and uh, grants would be awarded by April 15th. Thank you, Kim. Um, I didn't realize you were coming tonight. Otherwise, I would have actually just given you an agenda item. Um, uh, oh. But thank you for coming. Um, welcome. It would be very helpful if you can send that information so we can share it. Um, and Mike, can we get it out on an e-blast or something? Um, the only thing we had actually asked Kim to join us tonight just to kind of advertise for this because traditionally we don't e-blast out other nonprofit information. It, truly, this is something that benefits tall and residents. So we asked Kim to kind of advertise it this way and, and get it into the minutes tonight as well. Um, she shared with the website and things like that. So it's okay, considered, well then, considered can, advertised. Yeah. Can, can you get me that information? You can send it to the town council and we can get it out on social media and all that. I will. Thank you. And do you guys have a, a Facebook page that you can share or anything um, I'll, I'll like that? Um, we actually have, um, we have a Gmail account. Okay. And so if there were any questions or anyone needed any help, um, it is HFPG for the number four, mm -hmm. Holland at gmail.com. Okay. All right, then um, I look forward to getting that from you and thank you for coming and giving us the information. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening. No problem, thank you. Have a good holiday. Thanks, you too. Um, Lindsay. Yes, hi, I'm Lindsay Summerzaki at 127 Anthony Road. And I'm just joining in to um, express that I feel it's really important that the town of Tolland um, identifies racism as a public health crisis and that um, that it's a public health emergency and that not doing so would be an act, a racist act as it would, as not declaring it as a public health emergency would continue to support our, um, the ways that, the racist ways that our healthcare system is run. So I'm not just saying this willy nilly as a person who just kind of like wants to jump on the bandwagon. I work in healthcare. I know the um, disparities involved in with people of color, especially with COVID-19. So I uh, think it's really important that each of you consider that, um, you know, that you declare racism as a public health emergency and um, in my book, those of you who might say, no, it's not really, I would see that as racist for whatever that's worth based on my experience, my education, my knowledge. Um, one other thing is, um, Tammy, I would like to say that um, I believe that um, now that you're gonna be in a new role that I know you know, I know your thoughts on this, but I just want to say, I think you should step down um, as a member of the town council, as I feel that it would be a conflict of interest. I know you stepped down from other roles on the town council, but I really am kind of unsure um, of why you'll continue to serve both roles. Again, I know it's not against the rules, but it ain't right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Okay, not seeing anybody else. Oh, sorry. Uh, Luke Anderson. Hi, uh, Luke Anderson, 44 Zinfandel Circle. Um, and I'm Tolland High School class of 2016. Um, I've been a part of the effort to um, have people call to address racism as public health crisis in town. Um, I think we should join the 18 towns across the state um, and the Mashantucket Pequot tribal nation to do so. Um, and these include a wide range of towns, including smaller towns like Colchester, as well as larger cities and more predominantly uh, cities of color um, like New London, um, Hartford, uh, Bridgeport, um, but I think as a predominantly white community, um, as a lot of people from middle class background, we can take a very strong leadership role in addressing this crisis. Um, and I think this is the first step in embedding health equity in policymaking. And we can hold ourselves accountable across sectors um, by doing so at the town council. 
Um, and this public health crisis of racism goes far beyond um, what we're seeing with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, it's exemplified in it. And what we're seeing in black and brown communities, particularly in indigenous um, communities, African-American communities and Latinx communities is a symptom of racism. It is not um, the thing that needs to be addressed directly. Um, the issues that need to be addressed are found in policy, which are in our town zoning, um, education, uh, healthcare itself, which holistically, though not traditionally, should also include things like food security and recreation, which should take these measures into account. Um, town conservation and public celebrations, because I feel that we need to address um, the history of our town in its totality. Um, and doing so requires courage and um, frankly, maturity. Um, and we need to be able to do so that we can, so that we can transcend the history of our town, um, which has been able to be founded by the pushing off of indigenous people off of our land um, who had to flee westward um, into New York and join the Oneida Nation. Um, and these are both Nipmuc and Mohegan people. Um, and to not continue to share the stories of these people um, is frankly contributing to the ongoing genocide of their cultures. Um, we also need to address the fact that there were slave owners in town um, and that we do have a history of the same racism that we see in the South um, up in Northern states like Connecticut and in towns like Tolland as well. Um, there have been a number of studies that have shown that Connecticut um, is among the most segregated states in the nation as due to um, histories of redlining and other financing and zoning regulations um, that all need to be addressed at the state level, but we can take a leadership at the town level to address those as well. Um, so yeah, myself and numerous others have written in with our own personal experiences to account for this. Um, we re received some responses, or at least I have from some town council members, not addressing the full amount of what I am addressing now, which is why I thought it worthy to join in. Um, but we need to acknowledge that racism does not stop at the borders of town. It doesn't stay north of Route 140, west of exit 67, or on the other side of the Willimantic River. Um, and it is an issue here. And it is an issue at the systemic level um, and the institutional level, as well as um, within uh, people's beliefs and values and interpersonal actions. Um, and I do think that um, having somebody uh, overrepresent us in multiple positions, both at the state level and town level, um, and thus removing a seat for full representation for others in town um, is contributing to a culture of white supremacy um, and is a part of that racism. Um, and so ultimately a resolution like this, while it will not in itself address all of this, um, it is a statement of our values as a community and the direction in which we need to put those values into practice. Um, it provides a framework for implementing action even though it's not policy or legally binding, um, and it's not bypassing the community to enforce these new changes, um, which frankly I think is a ridiculous assertion because it is us members of the community um, requesting that this be done. Luke, I'm um, gonna have to ask you to wrap it up if you can, please. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I think predominantly white towns such as ours are frankly unlikely um, to engage in the reflection necessary to unlearn the prejudices that we've been raised with, um, which reassure our relatively comfortable ways of life. Um, and we need to have a spark in order to be able to do so. And I think this resolution um, and the leadership necessary to follow up on it can be that spark. Um, thank you. Thank you. This is Brenda Felici. I just wanna point out that that's the first time we've ever cut anybody off for a uh, public for um, public petitions. I know it does say is two minute limit, but we've never enforced that before here. And I just wanted to point out to Mr. Anderson, I'm sorry that you were asked to wrap that up. Thank you. 
I think we actually have in the past if we can think we have, but um, we have a pretty full agenda tonight, Brenda. So, you know, that was in recognition of that. Um, is there anybody else? I still want to go on record as saying that it was inappropriate. Thank you. And, and you have. And I'm just pointing out that we have in the past stopped to the limit. So both of us have been noted on the record. Um, I don't see anybody else. All right, we are going to move on to uh, number six, public hearing items. Tonight we have consideration of a resolution modifying the scope of Birch Grove Primary School Project and authorizing an appropriation of $1,869,941 for the excavation and replacement of soil and the financing of said entire appropriation by the state grants. Um, hi, everybody. Good evening. Mike Rosen, town manager. Uh, I'll try to kick us off. I also wanted to acknowledge that uh, Katie Murray is here as well, the chair of the building commission. So um, thank you for being here. Um, the, tonight, we're going to be having the public hearing, uh, which seems like it's been many months in the making to get to this point to finally put to rest the unsuitable soil issue over at Birch Grove. Uh, this resolution tonight is, in effect, the mechanics that um, accepts the money and um, and that that's being given to us so grace you know graciously by the state of Connecticut uh, to to rectify the unsuitable soil problem that we had over the summer. Um, uh, as a reminder, um, I'm sure most of you might probably know at this point, but the work on this project has technically already been done. It's a retroactive in a sense, reimbursement, but it's a lot of money that the town, uh, you know, through the Birch Grove project has fronted. And the, the idea behind this is that this will segregate this, this project aside to make it its own standalone project in the amount of $1.869 million, and thereby fi fixing that and making whole the original $46 million budget so that those, those projects that were delayed back in June, July, August, can in effect come back into the main project. So that's what's going on behind the scenes. This is in, it's simply this public hearing is gonna be on whether or not we'd like to accept the state money for the, for the unsuitable soil issue. Thank you. Okay. Um, Katie, do you have anything you want to, to add before we um, get into this or what Mike have good? Mike did great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions, but uh, Mike gave a, a very good summary. Okay, so counselors, before we open up the meeting to the public hearing, is there anything you want to ask? No? All right, then I will accept a motion to open the public hearing. Steve Jones, Ooh, do you have um, a motion? Oh, so Lou's hand was first. He'll, uh, he'll make the motion, I'll second. Oh, uh, yes, uh, I, uh, I moved to open the uh, public hearing on this issue. Okay, Steve, Steve seconded. Um, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Um, Brenda? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. I am an aye, so that uh, is unanimous. At this time, we're opening up the public hearing. If anybody has anything that they would like to say in regards to this, um, please, again, the directions are if you're on a device and you go to participants, you can raise your hand. If you are on a phone, it is star nine, and that will raise your hand, and we will call on you in the order in which your hands are raised. Katie. Thank you. Uh, I'm Katie Murray, uh, 8 Lisa Lane. Um, I am here both as a resident uh, of Tolland and as the chair of the Birch Grove Building Committee, um, and I think in both roles, I can say that uh, I think that we as a town should uh, accept this funding um, as part of the process of building a new school. There was a uh, finding on the construction site that cost extra money. Um, and as Mike Rosen well summarized uh, before, um, the state has gone out of their way to find additional dollars for our community to fund 100% uh, of the construction costs of removing and replacing this soil. Um, we as a town are incredibly lucky uh, in a very weird sense um, that the state has looked on the tragedy of our school's crumbling foundation 
in such a helpful and generous way. Um, no one wanted our school to be unsafe for our children. And when we stepped forward with a problem, the state rose to the occasion and came to help our community um, first at 52% reimbursement. And then uh, when the final legislation was negotiated, it came out at 89% reimbursement 100% reimbursement for the modulars, and now 100% reimbursement for this additional problem that was found on site. Um, and I, for one, as a private citizen, am incredibly grateful to everyone who worked diligently to help us so that we could build the school that we all want and I think our children deserve um, in the budget constraints uh, that were on us. So um, I think I certainly uh, would express that gratitude very loudly and ask everyone to join me. And I think one of the things we can do is simply to pass this, um, this issue before the council and allow the building committee to continue on our fun task of ensuring the school opens on time on budget um, in August this year. Oh, I'm sorry, August in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, anybody else? All right, not seeing anybody. I will accept the motion to close the public hearing. This is from the first motion to, motion to uh, adjourn the public hearing or close the public hearing, rather. I'll second. Okay, any discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Brenda? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. I have an aye, so that is unanimous. Public hearing is now closed. All right, uh, counselors, does anybody have anything on this that they want to discuss or ask questions on? Steve, your hand was up. I don't know if it was up to, to make the motion or to say something. It, it was up for the initial motion to close the hearing, so I'm all set, thank you. Okie dokie. Um, Lou? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That uh, being a member of the uh, of the Birch Grove Building Committee, uh, I would echo everything that uh, that Ms. Rosen and uh, Ms. Murray have sa has said. That this is uh, just a final step for us to get to move forward with the uh, acquiring the funding uh, and uh, ensuring that the project continues to move forward. So I would uh, I would urge all counselors to uh, to support this uh, this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Anybody else? Okay, um, I don't have anything either on this. So with that said, um, I believe there is a motion um, in here, Steve. Page it's, seven of the packet. I was gonna say, yeah, it's down, I think on, actually, is it? Oh, yeah, the motion. Will we have to do all the whereas is, Mike? Uh, I would recommend for something like this, we do, we go through technically the motions. So sure, let's do it. All right, Steve, hope you drink some water. All right. <laughs> I got plenty of water tonight. So I'd entertain a motion that the following resolution has been introduced and set down for public hearing on December 22nd, 2020 at 7 p.m. via Zoom remote meeting. Whereas on May 7th, 2019, the town of Tolland, by referendum of the voters approved a resolution entitled resolution authorizing an appropriation of $46 million for the Birch Grove Primary School Project and financing a said appropriation by the issuance of general obligation bonds of the town and notes in anticipation of such bonds in an amount not to exceed 46 million or so much as may be necessary after deducting grants, therefore, the school, the school project resolution and whereas pursuant to the school project resolution, the town council is authorized to reduce or modify the scope of the Birch Grove Primary School Project and that the entire appropriation authorized by the school project resolution may be spent on the Birch Grove Project as so reduced or modified. Now, therefore, be it resolved, one, that the scope of the Birch Grove project is hereby modified to remove and exclude the excavation, removal and transporter soil not suitable or able to support structurally the school building to be constructed as part of Birch Grove project and the replacement of such unsuitable soil with soil fill capable of supporting the school building and all costs related to excavation, soil purchase, exportation of unsuitable soil and imp importation of suitable soil from the scope of the Birch Grove project be it further resolved that the town appropriate the sum of $1.869941 for the cost 
related to the soil excavation and replacement project with such changes as the town council may approve. The town council is authorized to determine the scope and particulars of the soil excavation replacement project. The town council may reduce or modify the scope of the soil excavation and replacement project. And the entire appropriation is authorized hereby may be spent on the soil excavation and replacement project and so reduced or modified. Two, that the appropriation or that said appropriation for soil excavation and replacement projects shall be financed by grants received from the state of Connecticut. Three, that the town manager is hereby authorized on behalf of the town to execute any contracts with engineers, contractors, architects, and other persons for the soil excavation and replacement project. And four, that the town manager and other proper officers of the town are authorized to take all other actions which are necessary or desirable to complete the soil ex excavation and replacement project consistent with the foregoing and to utilize grants received from the state of Connecticut to finance said aforesaid appropriation. Do we have a second? This is Brenda Felucci, I will second very enthusiastically. <laughs> okay, um, any discussion? Uh, I would just like to say thank you to the town staff and um, all the town staff in both the Board of Ed building and the, the town hall building that worked on this to, um, to, to get what we needed to the state and also Katie to the, um, to the Birch Grove Building Committee for working hard with the state to try to get this all set and paid for. I appreciate all the work. Um, anybody else? Anything? All right, then. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, Brenda? A very grateful yes. Steve? Aye. Uh, John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. I am an aye, so that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, that gets us now to 7A, uh, reports of boards and committees responsible to the council. Brenda, do you have anything for us tonight? Um, yeah, this is Brenda Flucy. The Tourism Commission will be meeting next month. We're keeping an eye on all, on all the stimulus information that's coming. Um, I've been sharing on social media and there's been a number of mechanisms. If you're in the restaurant industry or hospitality industry, there's a lot of information coming out right now. Um, so please pay attention. There will be some additional dollars, hopefully available for you that you guys can qualify for. Um, I think the rest of my reports come under others. Okay. Katie, since you're here, do you have anything you want to update us on for Birch Grove? Um, we continue to review change orders that come up uh, on the project. Uh, these are um, mostly changes that um, either need to be minor corrections or uh, help improve in some way uh, the project for maintenance or how the school will run. Um, we are going to be uh, sending the technology and um, furniture package to the state um, in January, uh, late January. So we, the building committee will make some decisions about uh, final decisions about furniture in the beginning of January. Um, and other than that, the project is on schedule um, and I'm hoping to set up an opportunity for people to come and look at the mock-up room uh, within the first two weeks of January. Um, we have a, a, some COVID uh, related um, items to ensure that everyone who comes on site will be safe in a small room in person. So we do have some logistics to work out. Um, but other than that, things are looking great and I'm really excited how it's progressing. Perfect, thank you very much. I look forward to uh, being able to see the mock-up room. Alrighty then, that gets us to 7B, reports of town council liaisons. Uh, start with you, Brenda. Okay, uh, for sustainable CT, as we discussed a few times, they've released um, a list of the items that are new for 2021. Um, they include things, uh, some action roadmaps have been expanded. They include things such as participating in equity training, uh, develop and adopting uh, a statement on equity, um, Dr. Willett, enhancing pollinator pathways. I believe there was a recent um, project with one of the schools that we may be able to get some points on. Um, things like uh, promoting dark skies, collaborating with other municipalities, um, 
So there, there's a lot of information in there and I'm looking forward to working um, on many of those. Um, for Blights, there, the meeting that was this week was canceled. We will be scheduling another meeting by the end of the year, but it is only going to be to address the meetings, to approve the meeting schedule for next year. Um, right now, I do believe that enforcement um, has been canceled by the state of Connecticut. So um, for things like lights, but um, we had, don't really have anything coming up in front of us anyway. Um, census has had no meetings, but we do have some important dates to come up um, for those of you who are following along with the census. Um, as close to December 31st as possible, the Census Bureau has to deliver the population counts um, to the president. So um, that will be coming up in a little bit more than a week. And then as close to April 1st of next year as possible, the Census Bureau is sending redistricting counts to the states. The information there is used to redraw our legislation districts based on any population changes that happened um, for that April 1st, 2020 um, deadline. Let's see. Uh, land acquisition recently had a meeting. Um, we don't have anything to share with the town council. We will be continuing to um, take a look and get some um, questions answered. We should probably be talking to you in the next couple months. Um, and then planning and zoning. Um, they had a meeting last week and they approved with conditions a site plan for 65 Kingsbury Avenue. We got an update on a few outstanding projects. Um, and I, that was the, the bulk of that meeting. And that's everything. You had a busy couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve? Yeah, Steve Jones. So on December 10th, the Conservation Commission held their regular meeting. Uh, they discussed uh, and endorsed for further action by the chair, Jim Hutton, to uh, pursue a tailored mowing program with local, local farmers uh, at some of their conservation areas. Uh, they're continuing to discuss uh, usage of the new Paul Kill Mountain Bike Park uh, and kind of confirming that e-bikes, electronic motorized bicycles are not allowed. Um, trying to see what else was, was covered. Uh, members of the commission are planning to attend a future planning and zoning commission meeting due to the Bolton Lakes Watershed Conservation Alliance planning to modify town ordinances that provide greater ecological buffers around the Atlantic white cedar habitat that extends into Tolland. So they're looking to follow up with that. Um, Steve, I'm sorry, I don't mean to yes. interrupt. Is that the one that we, that you and I went on the walk with for? The one up off of um, Dockrell? Oh, yes. The um, park, I, right? I, yeah, it's the Atlantic white birch that are kind of on the border of that area. Yeah, and, and one, one of the members of the Bolton uh, Alliance went with us to walk that, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested if they're going back to walk it again, or if there's anything there. When we looked at that, that was a good that was a um, yeah. was a good collaboration effort between the Bolton Alliance and and what we're doing here in town. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. I'll, I'm just writing this down. I'll make a note of that to to provide us correspondence from the council to the commission at their next meeting in January. Um, otherwise, we had a water commission meeting last night. Actually. Uh, only real point of note was that there is a damaged fire hydrant on Kate Lane that I believe was associated with the winter storm. Um, in addition, uh, they're planning a leak detection visit. They found over the past year, I believe it was about 2 million gallons per quarter. I think Bev could confirm that. They've seen about 2 million gallons per quarter is um, not accounted for. So they're looking to figure out what the cause of that leak is. But it's, it's consistent enough that it, uh, poses a problem. Um, a otherwise, lot of it's been a good year financially. It is definitely a, quite quite a, a solid sum and it's been consistent. So it's not, you know, it's not changing in variable seasons. I think they discussed that, you know, if you saw dramatic changes, you know, you could kind of better pinpoint where the leak is and it could be a more systemic issue. Um, but otherwise, the Water Commission did report that their finances have been very good this year. I think they're up about <clears throat> $220,000 on their savings um, due to revenue and costs balancing out properly to improve their balance sheet. Um, and also due to the increased usage due to COVID-19 and families and individuals, professionals working from home, 
and students being home more often utilizing the water systems. And I think that about covers it for me. Oh, actually, one other thing that, that, that is being addressed from the Conservation Commission side is um, there was a report from the Corps head about potential illegal dumping on the Ned Wheat Conservation Area um, that's being addressed. And I believe it's going to be remediated uh, by the tree company that was hired to remove trees from a private residence's home. So uh, that's being handled. Otherwise, okay. I am all set, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, John. Yes, thank you. WPTA did meet and uh, we got an update on the Gerber pump station and the old Post Road pump station. They both had some uh, maintenance issues going on there. Uh, both sites have been repaired and are now operational and working well. Uh, we went into a year-to-date budget review um, uh, public works director reviewed the budget sheets and he said they're in good shape and there's nothing out of the norm budget and they'll probably get a new budget in January and may want to set a meeting in February to approve it. He said everything seems to be working well. We got an update on the 12 Schnitz at Lake Road project and if you've driven by there you can see the progress they're making there. Uh, but there will be two tie-ins to the, to the sewer system, uh, one from the new building and one from the old gym. All the fees have been paid for those. Um, and then we didn't have the uh, public works director from Vernon to give us an update on the Vernon sewer system, but the chairman of the WPCA did report that he heard through the town of Vernon WPCA that the project for the sewer plant did not include a water sprinkler system. So the system needs to be replaced and will add about $200,000 to the overall price. He said, other than that, they're on budget and they're behind and work completion due to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And we got a, uh, we didn't get an update on the College View project, but uh, Public Works Director did say he expected to attend a meeting last week to get an update on that project. So hopefully at the next meeting, I'll be able to report what took place at that meeting. And uh, let's see. Oh, and the last thing is um, Public Works Director said they're seeing a lot of activity behind the big Y with Santini properties. So um, there, there's going to be some apartments put back there, and, and they're starting to see a lot of activity there. And that was about it for the WPCA. Thank you. Um, I, I see the, um, the new building going up on Schnipset all the time. It looks great. Yeah. Um, Lou. Thank you, Madam Chair, that, uh, that Katie covered uh, pretty much everything that we needed to for uh, Bird Scroll Building Committee. Uh, so I have nothing to add. Thank you. No problem. Kurt? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's in, Brenda talked about the uh, Land Acquisition Committee meeting, so we can I can skip over that. And so I, I did attend the uh, Recreation Advisory Board meeting, and uh, we mostly talked about um, the possibility of getting of bringing back an ice rink for the town of Tollins. Um, there's a gentleman there, I'm sorry, I forgot his name, I didn't write it down. Um, he seems to be spearheading this project from the public side. Um, and the members of the board uh, viewed it very favorably. So the next step for uh, anyone interested in, to be looking to use a sustainable CT fundraising grant uh, to get, it looks like it's gonna be about $4,000 for the ice rink materials. Um, and so they'll be hopefully going through that process. Um, it probably won't be for this year just because of the, you know, the time frame. So you know, maybe uh, if everything goes as planned, uh, we'll have a ice, bring back an ice rink uh, in Thailand for 2021. So that was pretty much uh, the majority of the meeting. Um, that's all I got, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad that they're moving forward with that. I believe, is it Chris, I believe, that may have been there? Yeah, that, that's his name, yes. Yes, yeah. Um, kind of pointed him on the path of the sustainable CT in that. So being able to get that, I think will be great for the community. And did you have an EDC meeting? Oh, I reported that last meeting, but- uh, that last meeting? It was. Oh, okay. I can talk but... about it again if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I miss them, you know. <laughs> All right, then um, that gets us to new business. Um, eight, that one is consideration of a resolution to, uh, actually, I'm sorry, Mike, 
Um, I would like to propose we move up 8-4, uh, the consideration of the resolution for the Honeywell Corporation, up to 8-2. I think we need a two-thirds vote to do that just because Dr. Willett um, is going to be, I think, kind of speaking on both of those and in recognition of his time and the fact that he and I are on vacation. I'm recognizing that here. So and he's got, you know, we're, we're, we're going to bump him up if everybody is in agreement with that. So um, I will accept a motion to move 8.4 up to 8.2 if uh, we can get a two thirds vote on that. Steve Jones, I make that motion. Brenda Felucia, I second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Brenda? Aye. Steve? Aye. Jo John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. Aye, am and I, that, that passes unanimously. So, all right, I will go back to 8.1 right now. Consideration of a resolution to create a COVID fund, COVID relief fund for the Board of Education and authorizing an appropriation of $283,508 for the initial funding of the fund and the setting of a public hearing thereon for January 12th, 2021. So tonight we are discussing setting the public hearing. So um, any discussion that we have in regards to the proposal that's in front of us, now would be the time to discuss it. Mike? Sure, hi, uh, Mike Rosen, town manager. And uh, as I did before, I'll acknowledge some of the folks that are here for this item as well. So Dr. Willett is here, superintendent of schools, um, Lisa Hancock, the, our director of finance, on the town side and also several members of the Board of Education are here, I see. So uh, this is on the agenda. If you remember during the previous budget cycle and the resulting COVID pandemic, we had talked about if there were savings on the school side, what would happen to that um, dollar amount? And during those budget deliberations, um, we had talked about the possible creation of a COVID relief fund for the Board of Education, basically in an in expectation and anticipation that there was going to be unforeseen expenses due to COVID-19. It's just, just like on the town side, the board is going to have and probably has had already incurred many expenses related to COVID-19. So uh, for, we had said at the time that 40% of the savings could be earmarked for this, uh, not savings from the fiscal year 1920 budget, uh, could be earmarked and appropriated into this new fund once we established it and sort of set the parameters for the fund. Uh, we had to wait until this time though, because we needed the full and final audited number of the 1920 uh, unexpended budget, which fell, fell out to be about uh, $708,000, 708, 770. And 40% of that is 283,508. That's the number that's been audited and is the final amount. So, um, the finance director and the superintendent work together on the draft agreement that you see in your packets, counselors. Um, actually, since we put the packet out on uh, last week, prior to the snowstorm, there was one amendment that was made at the Board of Education meeting, which I'll address uh, now, just so you hear it from me. Um, basically, the amendment is going to be in section uh, three, use of monies from fund which is uh, under section A, COVID related activities. The wording that we have at the moment, um, we're gonna amend it and I can put it up on the screen, but let me just read it first. So monies paid to, the, to this board of ed Corona, or CRF shall be used by the superintendent of schools or designee for non-budgeted COVID related activities and for those COVID related activities that exceed available resources, provided that all such expenditures shall first be presented to and approved by the Board of Education. So this amendment was proposed and unanimously approved at the last Board of Ed meeting. So I'll try to put that up on the screen in a few minutes, but I just wanted to kind of set the groundwork on this. Um, so the item we have before us is a draft of what this proposed agreement could look like, but also understand that this has already been voted on by the Board of Ed. So it's up for council's consideration now, but, but ultimately we're setting a public hearing on this because in our charter, in uh, section four or five of the charter uh, concerning additional appropriations and public hearings, we do need to have a public hearing on this matter. Uh, normally, if we were to create a brand new fund, we would have a public hearing on it, but this is a fund that sort of has a, a built-in lapse to it after it, the funds are used. So since the, since the fund expires, 
we it's not a, a everlasting fund it's not going to be replenished necessarily but we are it's a temporary fund but we are going to do the public hearing anyway because it involves an appropriation of funds um, so that's sort of my overview I don't know if anybody else wants to uh, help me out with that and I'll try to type up this uh, amendment uh, into into the screen here thank you Just a what? small point. I was just going to say, do you have anything you want to you want to uh, mention, Doctor Wood? Uh, just a small point um, to follow up on uh, Mr. Rosen's summary, which was a really great one. Um, that if there are funds that are remaining, um, Provision Three uh, C has the potential for those funds to roll into the Educational Reserve Fund. So just to point out that it may expire at some point. Um, but then there was that provision that uh, to the extent you know, of the differential that was not funded. So it, you can fund up to 1%, which is 399,000. So the difference between you know, what was funded in the ERF last year and 399 could be rolled into the ERF from the uh, coronavirus relief funds provided. Those funds are not fully utilized. Um, so just to point that out, that's under 3C. But in addition to that, uh, or just as a, as a uh, asterisk on that, I think we're going to go through the entire fund. I, I don't expect us to have a lot left over at the end based on how things are trending right now. Um, so that provision may be moot, but I just wanted to point out that when, it, when this were to go away, that was part of, the, uh, that was part of this particular agreement that it, it could roll into the ERF. I believe what well, I think, uh, Lisa, you might have the actual numbers, but I think what well, after the um, after the audit, what 190 ish went into the ERF. So it would give them like a two hundred thousand dollar if if that I think it's a was it 170 something or 190 something. It was actually I think it was more in the 200 range. 240 um, probably 240 something. Yeah, so it was around 230 240 somewhere around there. Oh. Right, so it'd be like 150,000 if that were left, but I doubt that it will be, frankly. And then, then the other balance of the other 240 was going back to the general fund. That was the plan. Yeah, okay. about, yeah. Uh, I could just, if, if everybody's interested, I can share what the wording looks like to that amendment. I typed it up just now into an email. <laughs> so you can see what it looks like. Um, I don't know if everybody can see all that. I'll try to blow it up a little bit. Uh, pop that up. How about oh, that's that? so much better. Thank you. Okay, like sure. Okay. My so that's what the wording looks like for that section. And uh, um, so for the record also, thank you, Lisa, for that. Um, so I'm going to take, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. No, wait, no, no. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'll put it back. <laughs> I'm still reading it. Okay. No, nope, it's, it's back. Wow, now that I'm on the other end of the screen jumping, it's it's making my... <laughs> See, it's crazy, right? Um, I can get an appreciation, yeah. Okay, I'm good. Probably go. section. Everybody okay with me turning this off? Yeah, where, where will that be? I'm sorry, which section will that be? So this is under use of money from funds. Yep. It, we, we put Roman numeral three, but there's no Roman numerals, but it would be yeah. under uh, uh, section A, COVID related activities, Roman numeral right. one. All right, so it's Sorry. rewriting what we currently see for one. Yes, yeah, and this was what was voted on at the Board of Ed meeting last week. Okay. All right, thank you. I'm gonna turn this thank down. Thank you. Now. Okay, um, does anybody have any, if you guys wanna raise your hand, if anybody have any questions or anything for the, um, for the fund? We'll go around and see what everybody has. Uh, Lou. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first off, uh, I appreciate the Board of Education uh, uh, amending uh, Section one, uh, A1 to include that uh, Board of Education oversight. I think that's something that uh, I was going to uh, make a request for as well, uh, based upon what we had uh, before us in this packet. So uh, I appreciate their efforts on doing that. Uh, the question that I do have, though, is under uh, provision uh, I guess it would be 3C or, uh, or provision C regarding the ERF fund. My question is, is uh, and just for clarification for my, uh, for my own purposes, is by adding that money, uh, any, any possible leftover money from the COVID reserve fund, uh, adding that into the ERF, would that increase the overall 
Board of Education budget. In other words, setting a new uh, a new floor uh, for the, for their budget moving forward. So that was one of my questions. Well, uh, and not really. I had a, a question that's similar to that, Lou. Um, I don't see anybody else's hand up right now. So Lisa's wants. To, I think Lisa's hand was up. Um, Lisa Hancock, or no? Well, you're okay with me responding to that? Yeah. 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 No, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, basically, any amount to the limit of the one percent is. Um, is authorized by the special ordinance and state statute. That was already money that was in a base budget and would not increase the MBR for the Board of Education's budget. Now, had you added more money to their general fund budget, then that would have been something different. But this is just, what it's saying is they could add up to 399, whatever the, the amount is, and if they only get 220, but there's the rest left over to make up the 399, we could go to that extent without it having any impact. It would max out, yeah, it's, the, it would max out the 1%. Uh, thank you, that answers my question. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Steve? Yeah, Steve Jones, this is more of a, a higher level question, but in seeing item B under use of monies from fund in regards to matching funds related programs, uh, if required by any grants, are there any that we are foreseeing um, that would be suitable for this section? Or is there an anticipation that that might be brought up in a future legislative session or before Congress, if either Dr. Willett or Mike or Lisa are uh, aware of any potential funds that this would be utilized for as a match? Uh, Lisa, you can probably best answer that. I mean, I think uh, we've gotten meager FEMA reimbursements for, for the schools, but not much else, other than the CRF stuff from the state, 88, but that doesn't go in here. Meager okay. is generous. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, well, generous, yes, yeah, generous. No, I meant meager is generous, the word, not the, not the, not the uh, thing. Oh yeah, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> yeah. It allows for if, if um, some sort of COVID related grant or FEMA, um, especially FEMA, we have to pay 25%. If there's anything under FEMA that they can be eligible for, which is hardly anything, um, this gives the ability to use some of those funds for that 25% share. Or if something else new comes along under the same, you know, for a COVID related event where he needs matching funds, it gives this fund the ability to, to provide for that. I highly doubt anything will be used for that purpose, but it just puts it in there to protect. Yeah, it provides extra flexibility. Right. Okay. Yeah, that that um that covers it for me for at this point. Thank you. Okay. Um. So Lisa, you answered one of my big questions, which was the um whether or not we should look to um move the actual expenses into the uh, town general ledger so it wouldn't add to MBR or be in the run rate. But since it's going to be classified as a special fund and handled the same way as the one percent fund, that is essentially what we're doing anyway. Um. They would just get applied to that that fund and not be part of uh, the run rate or the um, MBR, correct? That is correct. Okay, and then the only other thing that I had when I was reviewing this um, this documentation is in here several times it says um, until the fund is no longer required. If I recall, when we started talking about this back at the budget time, we said that this was going to be um, a one year thing, and then at the end of that year. We had the ability if there were money, there were monies left to turn it over to the ERF fund up to the total 1%. But um, I'm concerned that in, in multiple places, it says um, until the fund is no longer required or um, upon closeout of the fund and it doesn't have a sunset date. Because it doesn't have a sunset, sunset date, I also think that leaves it open-ended rather than an ordinance. I'm not sure how that goes, but... Um, because then in D it says, the funds which remain at the close of each fiscal year within the COVID relief fund shall remain in the fund balance of said fund. Um, so I, I'm concerned that it's not, uh, that it doesn't have a sunset date like we originally talked about. If I can address that, is that okay? Absolutely, please do. I, I certainly understand your concern and it's certainly, um, the council's 
um, decision if you want to put the sunset date. I think with everything that has been ramping up again with the COVID, I wasn't sure um, that it was going to end in one year. Um, so that that's why I wrote it because we have no idea when this is going to end. And the impact on the Board of Education has been pretty um, demanding as far as financially demanding. So that's why I kind of left it open-ended and then at some point when, you know, when this is all over with, those, I mean, those funds could go away. I'm um, basically leaving it as not, you know, not adding any funds. It's the original funds until it's time, but certainly it's up to your all decision if you want to change something like that. Um, but just with the uncertainty, that's why I kind of left it open-ended. Yeah. I mean, we could, we could do a section four duration and have it be reviewed at a, a you know each year or, or reviewed for its you know it, for its necessity at the end of each fiscal year if, if that maybe sits better. I think uh, educational reserve fund, which is ordinance eighty six chapter eight, has has a review period. You know, every three years, I think it is, or something. Maybe COVID five. could be every, I think it's every five. five. Yeah, I mean, you could have this be every every annual, I mean, every year, if you if you, if that made it feel better. But I agree with Lisa that one of the things we don't know is we just you know they they talk about this in some cases going on you know well into into next year, and mm -hmm. although we don't really want to think about it that way, it may do that. So I guess that that is why this really you know we didn't really put anything uh, any termination date in here. So here's I my I can tell you that that. Too uh, so here's my here's my um, here's my thinking on that. Um, there's a part of me that likes the idea of keeping it uh, reviewable at the end of every year, um, because at that point we can say yes, uh, we're going to continue this, or no, we're going to close it out in recognition of the fact that um, on the last calls that I've been on, they won't even have vaccine available to general public until the April to June timeframe. And even then they're really assuming if they can get 50% of the people to voluntarily take the shot, that's gonna be a, a good number, um, which is not gonna be enough for herd immunity. So um, keeping it open longer, I, not necessarily against it. If I'm hearing you correctly, Dr. Willett, you're probably burning through that money now um, and Again, this is not a question to hold your feet to the fire or anything like that, but um, how are you feeling about this year's expenses from an expense perspective? Do you think at the end of the year, you'll have capability to put additional money into this fund for a next year thing? Or are you thinking truly a one-time thing? Because I honestly, from what I was on the board of ed meetings, it doesn't sound like you're going to have funds left at the end of this right now. Yeah, I mean, it, it is so hard to say in, um, you know, it, right now what the situation would be. But if I had to make a, con you know, if I had to say now, I would say that we probably won't. But um, it's hard to know because, you know, many things could change. The state could come back and, and offer things that it's not offering right now that may, you know, backfill some things we've been struggling with. So, you know, it all depends on what the political landscape looks like in the state for the next uh, you know, couple of months too and how the state responds to things. Maybe whether food programs are, we're struggling across the state with food programs. There's been a petition to the state to help with that. You know, if some of that stuff changes, maybe we would not be in the situation that we're in. But, um, you know, so it, it, it's really difficult to say where we'd be at the end of the year. But um, yeah, we, we are using, right now we've used, we would have used about 187,000 of the 283. Um, and so we are, you know, only, only in say January and we're at that point. So it is, um, it's very possible we would get to that 283 prior to the end of the fiscal year, unless something changes. Okay. Um... What do you guys, what does everybody else think? Lou, your hand is up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, that I think that when we were discussing this originally uh, dur during part of the budget process is that we were specifically discussing, as you mentioned, uh, a, a sunset date on it. 
because we did not want to create this as a uh, enduring fund. Um, I think, I, I, like you, I'm torn, divided as far as how uh, how this should proceed. But I think that uh, including a, uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Willett suggested, a section four, which would uh, include the uh, the terms and saying that it would last for a period like for a period of one year or during the normal budget period, and then be renewed um, or could be renewed by a uh, by a uh, vote of the town council. I think that's something that uh, would be appropriate and that, that we were ensuring that we're not creating an enduring fund uh, by inaction uh, in this case. And it could also be used as uh, almost as a, um, as the groundwork for if we do decide that this is something that is ongoing and we need to add additional funds into it that we may, that we can use the same framework and possibly use this as uh, that provision to add in funds if necessary. But I think that that's something that I would uh, uh, I would um, agree with what Dr. Willett had sa uh, stated earlier about possibly adding in a uh, section four for a, a sunset date on there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve. Yeah, Steve Jones, I was just going to um, add that I'm, I'm amenable as well to considering language that would provide either an annual review or perhaps language that would allow the Board of Education to review and provide recommendations to the council similar to what they've done with this resolution in of itself that they vote on whether or not there needs to be any um, form of extension or a recommendation for a sunset date um, when that time is, uh, is reasonable. Okay, uh, Brenda? Yeah, Brenda Falusi, I, I think I'm more leaning toward putting an annual review in for this because it, as we've seen um, this past year, we never know what's coming up. And I don't wanna put a sunset date if it's something that we're gonna have to come back and um, get rid of for whatever reason. So, I, I think I'm more leaning toward, you know, a yearly review to see if we continue to need it. And then at that review, we can always um, sunset it. I think that's where I'm pretty much heading to. Uh, it, I think that's that's what Dr. Willett proposed there for a fourth bullet, Mike. I don't know um, if you guys want to work offline to update that um, before the public hearing. I think that would kind of meet it. Um, and then we can just update the language, uh, just that it's going to be it's going to be reviewed on an annual basis. That way, if we find that there's money left at the end of the year and this is still going on and we have some needs, it's an option for us. If we find that, you know, we have alternate funding from something else that comes in that we can put it in there, it's, a, it's an option. Um, and if we find that there's no money in there and there's no sense in keeping it open, then we can just close it. Um, so I would say do a, a review, an annual review. And I would think, from a timing perspective, it would, well, we won't have actuals from July until probably around, I think like the September timeframe. Is that usually correct, Dr. Willett? So yeah. if we do like yeah, a review- would be more, It would be around August, August to September, yep. Okay, so if we put in maybe like a, you know, a September 1st review on that, we can decide to, uh, by then we'll know what happens with the budget in any given year and, um, what the the track is for the board of ed at that point uh and yeah, by the way just, oh, go ahead Walt. sorry i just I have something at the end no i i would say that's accurate you know i if i thought for some reason or i think i would that we would would have something we could contribute to the to the covid fund um i would be trying to make some public statements about that in the may or june zone you know april may june as we led into the end of the year so that, that would be well known to people and I would put it in front of the board in the May, you know, April, May, June, and we would have our final numbers reconciled you know, by August, September, as uh, Tammy said. So would you think maybe move it up then if you're gonna have your actuals and all that stuff and you, then we could do it by the end of the fiscal year on June? Yeah, well, I didn't August. say, I didn't say <laughs> actuals. <laughs> well, we it's a good <laughs> estimate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I, it wouldn't necessarily be actuals, but my intent, like I would start to see the potential for it. And of course the board would have to, the board would have to really uh, endorse, you know, that, that idea. But as we were coming in, 
I would be able to see that in the in the May June. I wouldn't know the actuals exactly, but we would be able to see that you know we might have that. Um, so I could at least start talking about it, you know, uh, and give some idea of that possibility in that range of time, May June, and then the actuals would be in, in August September. Okay, so uh, I, I think uh, so. I guess I'm not I'm not hearing clearly if we should do the review in like the uh, end of June time frame, or if it would be better to wait until the uh, September first time frame. Yeah, it's tough because this is the first time we'd ever be doing this. So I, I guess, you know, we could you could use June as as a target, or you know, and then if if for some reason that needed to be pushed back, that decision could be made at that time, yeah. because we would be having that end of year conversation around that time, you know, and the referendum in all that process would be having been passed. We'd be looking at the close of that fiscal year, and even though we don't have the final numbers until all things are processed. We'd have a picture of where it was going by June. So, so Mike, you could feasibly do it then, you know. Yeah. If you put a range in, we'll review it sometime between uh, July 1st and, and September 1st. I think that would probably give us the adequate leeway to review it as it comes up. Now, yeah, the only and at that, that point. Go ahead, Dr. Willett. At that point, at that point you would have. At that point, the fiscal year will have closed. So whatever funds, you know, would be rolled, would are would be rolled, you know, from a procedural standpoint, we would be talking about what had already been rolled. And then it would be just making the suggestion that it be used in such and such way versus the general fund type of thing. Correct. Then the only other thing that I had, I just some questioning around the uh, A, what we just rewrote, it said activities that exceed available resources. I do recall there was a conversation that um, if overtime was needed or something like that, but we weren't gonna be um, putting any uh, recurring expenses by way of adding staff with this fund. Is that still the, um, the understanding? Do we need to put that in here or is that just, um, you know, I'm just with the concern of the COVID related activities that exceed available resources. Yeah, that, that was my understanding of what I, felt, or I feel um, town council members wanted. For, yeah. So I, that's my understanding of it. I, I wouldn't come asking for that because I think that's also what um, Ms. Griffin's understanding at the FFC, you know, she's chair of the FFC and others. I think that is their understanding of it as well. So I don't think anybody would be coming asking, but. Um, do we but, need to um, write that in, Mike, or do, are we comfortable with it just being a commonly acceptable? I think based on the conversation we had, and I'm sure the minutes will reflect this as well, I think we don't necessarily need to write that in. Plus, it still gives, you know, Dr. Willett the flexibility if something uh, comes up that, you know, he absolutely needs to have staff uh, look at. It gives him still the flexibility on overtime and things like that. So I don't think we need to explicitly write this into the policy. Okay. All right. Uh, does anybody else have anything they want to add? All right, Mike, you've got your uh, your update orders. There's nothing yes. else for us to do on this tonight. Well, we do need to set the public hearing. Oh, that's right. We need to set the public hearing. Um, there's language in here for that, right, Steve? Yep, there is on page 13. So I would entertain a motion that the following resolution be introduced and set down for a public hearing on January 12th, 2021 at 7 p.m. via Zoom remote meeting of the town, town council. The draft resolution would be, be it resolved by the Tallentau Council that it hereby approves as follows, consideration of a resolution establishing a COVID relief fund for the Board of Education, approval of the written agreement approved by the Board of Education and an appropriation of $283,508 from the unassigned fund balance to the COVID relief fund. Move of all second it. Okay, any discussion? Um, all those in favor, Brenda? Aye. Steve? Uh, aye. Done. I think he, he said aye. Or, or he, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, Lou? There aye. Is. Kurt? Aye. I'm an aye, so that is unanimous. All right, we'll move that to public hearing. Now we are going to move up 8.4. So consideration of a resolution to authorize the town manager to accept a settlement offer from the Honeywell Corporation. 
So um, if for, for those playing along, we, we're going to uh, page 40 of the, the packet. We skipped ahead a bit here. So uh, this this item, um, I'm going to probably, and thank you for uh, reorganizing it so that Dr. Willett could, uh, you know, ha have this item a little bit earlier. Um, and also Lisa's Hancock's on the phone as well here. So this is an item that, um, you know, we, we had, we're engaged in a contract into an agreement with Honeywell Corporation. That's, they, they've been performing energy saving improvements for the town over the past several years. Um, they're, uh, maybe Lisa, I, I might turn to you to kind of give a little bit more of the background on this, just because I know you've been more involved over the past five or so years with this project. But basically, this item is here because uh, it's being seen as the right time to consider removing ourselves from this agreement. Uh, and there's reasons that are detailed out in the packet um, as to why this is the right time and, and potentially with, uh, you know, doing a cost benefit analysis. But um, they, there is a, a proposed draft agreement um, between the Honeywell to sever ties with the town. And it's also worth noting at this point that um, the, the general, the, the overwhelming majority of this uh, is on the Board of Ed side. Uh, the Board of Ed pays 96% of the debt and the town only pays 4% of the debt. So it's, you know, even though it's a joint effort, it's, it's very weighted towards the schools. Um, I, I'm gonna probably hand off to Lisa to, or Dr. Willett, whoever feels more comfortable to kind of explain where we're at with this. So who wants yeah, to Lisa, go first? <laughs> Lisa, do you want first, you know, first crack at it? I mean, I can, off, I can definitely go, go into it. I, I, I think it's a good idea to uh, engage in the settlement agreement. So I'll, leave, I'll put the period there and just have Lisa, whatever you wanna say, and then I can come in yeah, after and you if you want. then elaborate more um, because Peter certainly shared a lot of information, which we did put in your packet. Um, over the years with this whole ESCO agreement, we refurbished many of our um, schools, uh, the equipment created some efficiencies, and the original plan was to finance the debt in such a way that we keep increasing the budget here. And I'm sorry, my phone went off. Um, we keep increasing the budget each year to pay the debt. Then a few years ago with the way that the debt was structured, it was really going to cost us a lot more money with in interest uh, interest costs and all that. So we refinanced the debt associated with this whole program, which kind of leveled the payments and saved us over a million dollars. It was probably, I can't remember the number, but it may have even been close to 2 million at that time. So the original agreement would do what is called a measurement and verification process each year. The town and part of our contract was to pay for them to do this agreement. And then you have to have a consultant also analyze that Honeywell did the evaluation correctly. And there'd always be some fighting going back and forth. It's gotten to a point now where there are some inefficiencies in the system and the cost involved on Honeywell's side is substantial where they're not coming to the table to fix some of those items. And Walt, stop me if I'm wrong or correct me. <laughs> um, at the point now, the, the turn back of after they do a measurement and verification process, the consultant looks at it, is coming to a point now with what we get back from Honeywell in a check for the inefficiencies is actually less than what we're paying them to do the analysis. So it's certainly not worth it for us to continue with this process. Now we could just say, under the contract, we could just say, we're not gonna do this anymore. We're not gonna, the only way we can get the money back is if we can continue with the m and process, which you have to pay for. If we just say, we're not gonna do that anymore, then the town basically has no more guarantees being paid to them. With this respect, we're, we're still at a point where we recommend, let's just end this process, but Honeywell, Honeywell will at least give us a lump sum payment towards 
what probably would have been paid out over the next 10 years or whatever is left on the uh, 10, 15 years left on the contract. So that's where we're at with that. Plus, um, like I said, there's a lot more detail in your packet that explains it probably even more clearer than I did. Yeah, we just, we don't need this agreement anymore. It's not, um, it's not beneficial for the district. The M&B process, which we pay for, it's measurement and verification. Each year, the town and the board pay for this together. It's about $40,000 and 25,000 is roughly the board's share of it. And we pay to have a measurement and verification done to see if we're getting the savings that uh, we were, uh, you know, what we were projected to get. And then we are given us uh, you know, money when uh, that, if that shows that we aren't quite getting the savings. And so each year we have gotten money back on the MNV process, but that money is diminishing each time we do it. And it's starting to become a, a, a non, no longer worthwhile uh, endeavor. We do have to have our staff spend a tremendous amount of time on this process, both town and board. So if we were to actually now add up the staff hours that are going into this, um, we're probably getting almost ze you know, zero return when you consider the human hours that have to go into what we have to provide for the measurement and verification process. Um, not only that, this, this has also had over the years related fees. Um, we've had a term, you know, a company Celtic involved and um, you know, we just don't need to be spending this money at this point. We have an excellent facilities director and there's excellent, uh, on the Ford of Ed side, Pete Staub is amazing. On the town side, you've got great people there as well. And, you know, they are able to uh, actualize a lot of these savings uh, without having this agreement. Um, terminating this agreement at this time has a uh, return for the board in the town that you can find in the paperwork here. It's about 200,000. It's a decent return um, to end the agreement. And uh, you know, what we're getting from m &V now would be years and years before you know, we would get that kind of return. But uh, you also look at it from a human resource standpoint, it'll increase our productivity to end it. And we are able to do these efforts on our own. It was a uh, good thing in the beginning. It, it had some real offsets, but now I think both Honeywell and the town and board realize that it's time um, you know, that, that this end, its usefulness has come to an end at this point. They're speechless. I guess that means we're all set. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I thought it was a good summary. <laughs> it was an excellent summary. I, I don't know if Chairman Nietzsche, it looked like you were speaking, but you were muted, or if you're just waiting for um, people to be called upon. I see Council. Oh, I'm Lewis sorry, there. I was muted. Yeah, um, uh, Lou, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mom. Thank you, Madam Chair. My oh my gosh, I thought you called me Mom for a second. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Mom, no, um, Madam Chair. That uh, my main question is, uh, I know that I mean this, of course, coming back to the legal issue of it. It's a legal contract that we're looking to uh, now terminate. And my question is, is has legal reviewed this on both the town side as well as the BOE side? Because uh, I know that both parties are looking to terminate it, but uh, I want to make sure that there was no issues regarding any uh, um, regarding any possible liquidated uh, or liquidation uh, um, issues or anything else like that, uh, liquidated damages or uh, other claims that we could be facing by terminating a contract early, uh, even by agreement. So I can answer that one, Lou, um, since at least for the town side. So we did reach out to Rick Conti, the, the town attorney, about it. I'm not sure if the board has done the same. I, I don't, let me just phrase it this way. I don't anticipate that we're going to make a decision on this tonight. I think we just wanted the council to um, hear it for the first time and perhaps can start to mull it over. I know the Board of Ed would probably like the opportunity to talk about it again at a, another one of their meetings. But um, as for the legal question, uh, Rick has reviewed it. In fact, he did have two comments that we did send back to Honeywell to uh, take into consideration. It, just for as an example, and I'm not sharing anything that I shouldn't be here, but this, this uh, settlement agreement draft 
doesn't say anything about it being subject to freedom of information, which when you make a settlement with a public entity, you uh, that document becomes public. So we have to build that into this as well. So, and there might be another provision, which we, you know, just for example purposes, but we did send that back. We're awaiting their acknowledgement and uh, agreement that we should put that into the document. But um, I think Walt and I and everyone else involved with this, we're sharing it with our elected officials and then potentially what might yield would be a joint meeting between the two entities, the Board of Ed and the Council. I think that's something Walt and I discussed as an option so that we can jointly um, sign off on this agreement. Uh, Walt, that's correct, right? That we'd wanna do maybe a joint meeting? Yeah, I think there, uh, there were board members who wanted to have a joint meeting. I think that would be a, a great thing to do so both elected bodies can uh, be together and talk about it. Um, just to the point, uh, Honeywell, Honeywell, in my estimation, appears eager to reach a settlement as well, because um, you know we have a relationship now that spans a number of years. We know each other like two two teams might know each other, you know that play each other, and uh, you know I think we're both at a place where we we are both recognizing that this would be in you know, the mutual best interest versus the alternatives that could be part of the future. So uh, I think Honeywell will be quite amenable to this uh, and, and they've shown that they are. So it's just gonna come down to whether the council and the board feels like this is something that they ultimately wanna engage in. And I did send it off to a board's legal counsel as well. Um, okay. so uh, that, that was, oh, I mean, I, that, that, no, that's my main concern is that, um, is that it's reviewed and that, uh, that there's a meeting of the minds because uh, I understand that, that there's been a, a long time, long term working relationship. Uh, that's, and I think that's outstanding, but all you need is just one change of a, of a, of a leadership on, I, um, on Honeywell side or somebody else that just has a different view of it. And I just want to make sure that both uh, the board as well as the town are covered. So thank you very much. Thank you both for the, for the answer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you, Lou. Um, Steve? Yeah, Steve Jones here. I was, I, I'm sorry if I missed it in the um, outlying document, but do we know that if we were to accept this settlement, what the breakdown would be between the town council and the board of education and, and further what um, the funds that we would get from that buyout would be designated for? Would it go to a particular fund or be um, designated for a specific purpose? Well, I think it was pointed out before that um, the majority of these funds are, are, well, the majority of the work was on the, the board side. Um, yeah. And, you know, there is a debt service agreement that, that is worked into the UIS agreement that we, you know, the board does help, that does pay for. So I think the majority of it would be board, but I believe that the conversation uh, that the board and the town council can have would be around where, and I can see the you know utility internal service fund as part of that conversation. Couldn't you, uh, Lisa and Mike? Is that what you're more? And Bev, I know Bev was involved with this too. So I think that's probably part of the conversation would be where where the settlement would go, and I think Yusuf would be one of the con you know potential places that that, that might happen. Okay, uh, and then. I Oh, sorry. So and then one other question. I just wanted to confirm with um, with town manager Rose in the draft resolution. Are, are we not taking action on that tonight or is or are we doing that consideration um, by the end of the conversation? Uh, uh, hi, Mike Rosen, town manager. Uh, Steve, I don't think we should take action tonight. I think this was the intent was to introduce this tonight. Uh, okay. uh, I, I wouldn't take action be only because Honeywell has not yet responded to our um, lawyers uh, comments. Okay, just want to clarify that. Thank you. Um, John? Thank you. I, I was just curious, uh, do we know if Honeywell has a, uh, a history of these types of settlements or is there anything historical that we can look at from other communities? Or do we, do we know that or no? I'm not aware of anything. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Okay. So thank that's you. a, go ahead, John. No, I just said thank you, that's it. Okay. So that's that's a good question. Um, I'm glad you're saying that we don't wanna, we shouldn't probably take action on this because that was gonna be my suggestion. I, I read through all of this and there's a lot here. There's, um, there's a lot of information here that I think we really need to understand 
um, before we go forward. And in the discussion that we just had, a couple of things that, that were said, I have questions on. So when we're doing this analysis, we're saying that Honeywell side of it is substantial enough that they're not comfortable with coming to the table to fix the issues that we have. Aren't they contractually obligated to fix the issues? Um, well, there, there is a, uh, like I said, a long history here. I think that um, in the process we have gener generally shown the board and the town have worked very, very hard to show how, uh, how much we're adhering to the agreement and, and how we've even worked with energy settings that have been more aggressive than what we've been uh, proposed. I think it's a complicated uh, situation when we talk about, you know, whose fault something would be or not be. And I think um, that's part of why uh, I think the town and the board and Honeywell uh, all sort of see a settlement as a good idea. Um, I would also say that there are aspects of the settlement agreement we would want to pay close attention to as we discuss this. Um, and just keep in mind that, you know, um, that there are probably aspects to this that you know, we can learn about together, but, um, you know, find ways to talk about it within an understanding of what the settlement agreement has in it. So this is a great first read and people, you know, taking a good look at the settlement agreement would get a sense of uh, some of the aspects and the dynamics of this. And then it would be great if we had a joint meeting after that and we can come to the table having had time to really digest um, the reasoning behind why, the, why we think it's a good idea to separate and also what the settlement agreement has in it with respect to you know, what it expects to talk about and, and, and so on. So I, I just take a look at that and I think it would be great then to get that back together once we've looked at those things. Okay, so, so that's gonna be an outstanding question that I have then, because I'm, I'm a firm believer if you enter into a contract, you're held to that contract. And if they're saying, you know, it's gonna cost them too much money, to be quite frank, that's the contract. So um, I, I would be interested in definitely seeing all the backup on that. My, my other concern is, um, you know, this was a huge project for the town. This was a big outlay in money. It was, you know, supposed to save us a significant amount of money over the years. We've, we've bonded a large amount of money on this. It's been a big expense on, of course, the Board of Ed because they utilize the majority of the energy in that. Um, and the intent was that it was supposed to last for significant years. So I'm concerned that we went into a contract for a, a period of time that was a high dollar amount. There was a lot of refinancing, a lot of changes to buildings and stuff like that. And now halfway through the contract, we're saying that it's not good anymore. So, so that's, that's a concern for me. Um, it's a concern that you, you, did we make the right decision? Are we making the right decision now? So I'm definitely, definitely, definitely not ready to vote on this in any way, shape or form. And I'm probably going to be sending over a page full of questions to fully understand why we're thinking that our best option is to get out of a contract that the, you know, and I think that this had to go to referendum. No, I wasn't sure because of the bonding, if not, if it was a referendum item or if it was just within our, our allowable amount of bonding. It actually wasn't a bonding. It was a um, lease purchase agreement and that did not have to go through a referendum process. Okay. Um, uh, refinancing of the lease. But the refinancing, so it was just a refinance of the lease. We didn't bond to refinance the lease? No. no. Okay. Um, let's see. You know, and I'll be honest with you, the fact that Honeywell is eager to reach an agreement makes me think that, you know, I don't know, that just, it, I'm just, uh, I'm definitely um, glad we're not going to we're not gonna try to vote on this tonight. Um, so I am in agreement with setting up a, a joint meeting when we get the information that we require. I'll leave the, the logistics of when we have that information between Dr. Willett and Mike, and then Mike, you, can, we, you and I can sit down and figure out when we can get that done. I know that the Board of Ed has a lot going on right now in community conversation and everything else. So um, Dr. Willett, I'm not sure if you have any anticipated uh, timeline on when you think this might happen or when the meeting is. But at that time, I'm expecting um, any questions that the town council has, we will definitely have written and submitted over for people to review so we can discuss it um, together at the joint meeting. 
Sure, I think that's a great idea. I don't think, um, Tammy, anyone had an intention that the town council would, would act on it tonight per se. I think it was more, I know the board wanted to know what the town council's thoughts were on it. And this is the first chance the town council's had, a, had to really look at it. So, you know, I don't think anybody intended on it, on it just kind of rolling through tonight, but, um, but I think that's a great idea. I think taking a little time to digest it and looking at sections of that settlement agreement um, and the questions that'll, uh, that'll help help get to a point of resolution you can feel comfortable with. So uh, I think it's a great idea. I think the board wants that too. Uh, a joint session would be great. And uh, I think we can set that up. Uh, I would just reach out to our to the board leadership. And uh, I think we can set it up fairly soon after the holidays, you know, once we get into January. Okay. Um, and you know, the only reason I'm saying that is because it was on here for a, a resolution. So <laughs> that's the only reason I'm saying that, you know, I wasn't ready. When I read it, I was like, uh-uh, I'm not ready for this. Um, well, they're, well just, they're just giving you all the info up front, you know? I mean, I think that's yeah. just, they're just so efficient over there. Yeah. Just like, like, here you, know. you go. <laughs> Let them have cake. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, that uh, based upon all the discussions here, I would uh, uh, at this point I'd move that this be uh, tabled for uh, for all business uh, for the next meeting, so that we can put the, uh, I'll review it uh, and uh, and get together our questions and get them uh, over to uh, Mr. Rosen and Dr. Willett uh, to to, uh, to be addressed. So the motions to indefinitely postpone until the next meeting. Well, I think yeah, we should definitely. If nothing else, I think we should we should table it to the next meeting and then the board, the town council, we can have a conversation um, at that meeting to, to decide what our overarching questions are or whatever. Cause I think that would probably be more efficient than all of us sending you a slew of questions, Mike. Uh, yeah, that'd be appreciated. I mean, if we have uh, our next meeting, our next regular meeting is January 12th. Um, I don't know if we wanted to maybe try to fit the joint meeting in well before or after, it sounds like we might want to do it after the 12th. Well, do you think Honeywell's going to, you know, between the lawyers and Honeywell and the holidays, do you think they're going to be able to get back to us by then? And that is just going to be the, the lawyers' uh, mm -hmm. questions and responses. Dr. Willett, you said that the board still has to review this also? Um, the board has uh, talked about this and knows the reasoning. Uh, there was an uh, agenda item on the reasoning for it, much like you saw tonight. Um, the settlement agreement itself has some provisions in it that, uh, you know, that um, at this point, I know I would, I would bring to them, but this, you're seeing these provisions. Some of them talk about uh, certain aspects of those provisions. I just wasn't sure how to handle with respect to public meetings. So, um, you know, we'll get some guidance on that and then we'll, we'll also put it there, but they, they got all the reasoning just like, um, you did, there's an agenda item that discusses all of the reasoning for why, uh, why we would recommend um, terminating the agreement. Okay, all right, um, Steve? I was just gonna uh, second uh, Councilor Luba's motion to uh, table the item under old business for a future meeting. Perfect, um, any discussion? Just on the wording, it should be indefinitely postponed. <laughs> yes. Table yeah. means you're going to take it up again later in the same meeting. It definitely postpone means you're going to take it up at a future meeting. Yeah, tabled indefinitely is, is what I'm in agreement with, if that's correct. Thank uh, you. Post, for that. Postpone, postpone indefinitely. Yes. Okay. okay. Any other discussion? All right, all those in favor? Uh, Brenda? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. I'm an I, so that passes unanimously. Um, thank you, Dr. Willett. Feel free to sign off and go enjoy your uh, your evening, your vacation evening. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank everyone. you. Yeah. All right. That gets us to back to the original 8.2, which is consideration of a resolution for the 2020 Steep Grant Award for the Talent Recreation Center improvements and storage in the amount of $128,205. Okay, uh, Mike Rosen, town manager. This should be um, a relatively quick agenda item. Uh, so if you remember a few months ago, we applied for the steep grant. Um, this, this grant cycle, which again, the steep grant, the small town economic assistance program grant um, provides 
uh, some assistance for capital project, capital needs for communities that are labeled small towns. Uh, normally the grants go up to $500,000, but this year uh, the state's intent was to give smaller grants uh, and try to get more towns to get some benefit rather than giving some you know, few towns, big benefit. So we had put in for an application for 128,205, which was the grant max. Um, and that was to um, to do some improvements over at the recreation building, uh, including um, a, a handicap accessible doorway with uh, those buttons that keep that prop the doors open, um, improvements to the gym flooring, uh, improvements to the, the bathrooms and also um, water fountain. So they're the bottle dispenser ones, not the ones where you put your mouth on. So they're hygienic and also kind of fit into our COVID world right now. And, uh, and, and another big aspect to it was storage needs for the public safety department, where they, there was sort of a, a collaborative deal that we had between recreation and public safety about we there's a room there that that could be used as a storage room if it's brought up to better standards uh, climate controlled clean and you can store ppe in there so we had applied for that grant back in i believe june or july i forget exactly i remember heidi was still here and um we were awarded the grant and simply this is uh for us to accept the grant award money and so that we can get the ball rolling on uh, doing our paperwork and uh, getting the project going. That's all I've got. Perfect. Um, anybody have any questions? Okay, well, um, thank you guys for submitting the grant. I'm, I'm happy to hear that we're gonna be able to free up some room at the fire station. I know when we went on our tour, it was, uh, it was pretty tight in there where they were storing a lot of stuff. So having a room to be able to store the, um, the PPE and also having spent a whole lot of time in the recreation building. Um, I understand the gym floor and, um, and I appreciate the water fountains and definitely making those doors handicap accessible is, is a big win for us. So um, I appreciate all the time that was put in for the grant. And um, do we have a completion timeline on when this will all be done? Uh, I'll look to Scott for that one. Have any idea, Scott? Hey, Scott, I didn't even no. see you pop on. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I come in and out. So the, um, the problem is we're not able to do anything until the council had authorized Mr. Rosen to um, move forward with this. We have to get documentation in place. Uh, so for me to try to give you an estimate on how long it's going to take, I think once we get the ball rolling, it'll probably be, uh, you know, less than two months total because they can be um, different projects can be worked on simultaneously. And and just to clarify, the work for this is going to be bid out as well. We need to bid it out, right, Bev? I thought no. Um, we're able to use the Easy program through Crocs. Oh, so we yeah. won't have to, but we're still waiting on the assistance agreement. Um, this is the first step, so you can then send the assistance agreement. So okay. hopefully that'll come within a month or two. Perfect. That, e that eases the bidding process because you can go through that easy program. Sorry, I got yeah. confused. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else have any other questions? All right, then um, I'll let, go ahead, Steve. All right. And there's a motion that now therefore be resolved by the Tallinn Town Council. One, that it is cognizant of the conditions and prerequisites for the state financial assistance imposed by Connecticut General Statute Section 4-66G. Two, that the filing of an application for the state financial assistance by the town of Tallinn in an amount not to exceed $128,205 is hereby approved and that Michael Rosen, town manager, is directed to execute and file such application with the Connecticut Department of Economic and Development Community Development to provide such additional information to execute such other documents as may be required to execute an assistance agreement with the state of Connecticut for state financial assistance. If such an agreement is offered to execute any amendments, decisions, revisions thereto, and to act as the authorized representative of the town of Tolland approved by the Tolland Town Council on December 22nd, 2020. I'll second that. Any discussion? Sorry, Lisa, that was John Regan, if you didn't know. Um, all right, all those in favor? Uh, Brenda? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. I'm an aye, so that's unanimous. Thank you very much.
All right, that gets us to our biggie for the night, 8.3, discussion and first look at the Firehouse Capital Improvements Project. Okay, uh, Mike Rosen, town manager. Um, we've got a bunch of people I have to acknowledge right off the bat here. So for this for this one, we've got DPW director Scott Lappin, consulting engineer Chuck Eaton, uh, public safety director and fire chief John Lytell, many, many members of John's staff and also the volunteer fire department are on. Uh, I, I, Lisa, pretty much everybody who's on uh, staff wise is probably for here for this item. So uh, Kelly's here, I see, uh, Tina. The, so we have a lot of people here that are interested on the staff side to, to see this, this project come to fruition. So for a little bit of background information on this, um, for several years in the five-year capital project plan, um, we've seen moving along the spreadsheet Firehouse Improvement Capital Project. And uh, at the time, it was, it's, it was what was considered the last town uh, buildings to be renovated in our cycle. Um, we've gone through a lot of the other buildings and, and the fire stations now need some attention. So um, the previous town manager, Steve Werbner, uh, uh, met with, I'm um, sure, Scott and John and talked about it. And it took over the course of five, 10 years and it got into the capital plan, started moving down the line. And what they were trying to figure out was what exactly needed to be improved for the fire stations and which there, of the four firehouses who, you know, what needed improvement. So now that I, I've been here for about almost a year and a half, a little bit less, we've talked about this um, and it's time to, to fund this project. We're, 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 it's, it's been slated for the next fiscal year, 21, 22. Uh, and we needed to figure out exactly what we were gonna be, you know, doing in this project. So in the last budget cycle, if you, if you all remember, we had a study that we were funding um, to have an engineer consulting firm come in and um, take a look to see what needed to be done. And specifically for fire stations, 140, 340, and 440. 240 is not part of this, um, this, this project plan. Um, and we were fortunate that we were able to hire Chuck Eaton's firm. Chuck, for those of you who know, is our town engineer, our consulting town engineer, and he represents the CHA companies. Um, and so he's very familiar and intimate with this, with the, the fire stations and, uh, toured all of them. I, I toured them as well. I know council had toured them in the past. And uh, what we figured is that we needed to address a few overarching things for the 140, 340, and 440. Um, 140 has a crumbling foundation issue, which has been kind of, it's been, it's been holding the fort, but it's, uh, it, it's something that's still out there in the in the background that we want to address it. Basically, my thought is if we're going to do some improvements now, now's the time to get that problem solved with 140. And also um, bringing its uh, bathrooms and kitchens up to ADA requirements, doing electrical and drain work, extending the service bays and adding additional building space. Uh, fire stations 340, 340 and 440, which we'll get into in a, in a moment, we're recommending through Chuck that... Um, they're better suited to actually be demolished and replaced with pre-engineered metal buildings. Uh, and then just finally, the last thing I'm gonna say before I turn this over to um, John Lytell is that the placeholder number that we have been seeing in the spreadsheet for many years was $3 million. At the time, that $3 million number was, was really a placeholder number. It didn't include the crumbling foundation problem. It really only addressed um, bringing things up to ADA compliance and code compliance. It didn't address space needs at all. Uh, it was kind of just a shell number. So the number that we're proposing, 5 million, has been vetted, and that's the number that we'd like to use going forward. So uh, I'm going to actually share my screen at this point. And um, John, if you don't mind, uh, would you take it from here? Sorry, everybody, for the headache with the, the moving screen. But um, John's going to be, since he's been here for so many years, he'd like to take you on a little bit of a virtual tour through 140, 340, and 440. Go ahead, John. I'm sorry, actually, before you start, John, I just want to take a minute to uh, thank you guys all for being here whenever anything with the fire department is on. We have a very robust attendance for uh, town council, and I, I appreciate the fact that a lot of you guys are volunteers and you're here um, because you're passionate about this in our town. So I just wanted to thank everybody for coming and everybody who's uh, helped work on this before you kick off. And I don't know if Mike, you can make this a little bit bigger in case people have the have a need to, I don't know, is it like a present in this? Not, it's in the, it's in the PDF. So I don't know that you can. Is 
sorry about that, everybody. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to put it up full screen. Um, Okay, there you go. Oh, that's good. That's better. Okay, go ahead, John. Sorry about that. That's even better. I don't even have to read. It's in, <laughs> it's in full view. So just like uh, Mr. Rosen said, for many of you that have not uh, seen or been here, um, this is something that's uh, dear and hard to many of us uh, in the community. And um, some things have changed over the years. So as you see, station 140 is the uh, first topic. Um, we thought that uh, we'd go after that building first because that's obviously got the crumbling foundation as well. Um, the last thing I want to see is putting something uh, as far as improvements into the system and then all of a sudden finding out that we've uh, rebuilt something and it's got crumbling foundation. So Chuck will uh, touch base on that or uh, Scott will. Um, but basically that station was built in 1995. Um, that's the other main headquarters that's located off of Crystal Lake Road. Um, we run two main stations in town. We have four stations total and one training center. Um, so in, in depth wise, we'd like to bring out the bays to be true double back-to-back uh, -back bays. When I say that, I mean, in general, just to fit the uh, size of the apparatus. Back in the day when it was built in 95, we had a lot of apparatus that was, the eras of 1960s or 70s that were smaller apparatus. Today's apparatus uh, range in depth of uh, 30 to 38 feet long. So we'd like to um, have some expansion of the bay lengths, either pulling them out or expanding them to the front or the back, as well as making a secondary uh, larger, um, not training room, but workstations, um, meeting the bathrooms up to uh, the guys are taking, especially in the COVID the last six to seven, eight months, um, the showers are being used very uh, heavily um, after a lot of our COVID calls and everything else wise. And we've used that a lot over the last 10 to 15 years, especially with a lot of storm damages and everything else wise. My problem right now at the COVID times are um, when we have the storms as well as the snowstorms or windstorms is keeping staff at the stations overnight. Um, I am very, very limited that I can't um, house uh, staff overnight during the uh, storms right now, especially with the COVID times because of space needs. So this is the first time um, a week or two ago that I had to tell our director of uh, our operations director of public works, uh, Paul, um, that works very well with us and Scott works very well with us that we weren't keeping staff overnight wise because of volunteers and career staffing that we can keep staff for the first time that I've taken over in 20 years that I didn't keep people in a firehouse overnight during that last uh, blizzard that we had. So we're looking at um, so space needs to kind of just pe put people overnight into the stations. Station uh, 140 is one of our newer stations uh, built in 1995. So you can see in the description of what we're trying to do with that space. Um, you know, it's something that I don't like to put all our eggs in one basket. Um, if the training center, which is our EOC, gets blown over or goes down, I don't have anywhere else to operate in town. Um, so that would be the secondary station. So the description is in there as far as what we're trying to do. We were very fortunate that the council approved the extra savings that we had in the ambulance rescue recovery fund to purchase two storage sheds that we just got up um, just about a week, two weeks ago. And unfortunately with the snowstorms, I'm a little behind the eight ball um, of storage needs. So they are in place, but that will at least eliminate some of the storage needs at that firehouse. Back in 2011, we tried to go for a Morton type of building that would be up at that location. Um, and unfortunately, because of, you know, whether it be budget times or other things, it just, um, we're at that point now where we're trying to um, upgrade our stations. And we're at the last uh, piece of the pie, which I understand 110%. Uh, um, so that's uh, overall the station. Um, the station is open anytime, Monday through Friday from eight o'clock till, you know, four or six o'clock at nighttime that anybody wants to stop by and look at the station, um, they can stop up there and look at it. But <clears throat> that's the other main station. Station 340 that's up next, that was built in 1975. Um, our parks and facilities and facilities maintenance have done a phenomenal job as far as trying to upkeep the building as much as we can. Um, just about five years ago, we removed most of the asbestos out of the uh, firehouse. 
uh, with the help of Scott Lappin and uh, a contractor. So we got the asbestos out of the floors and the rest of the stuff, but the bathrooms itself are inadequate. The kitchen itself is in the apparatus bays. Um, so it's kind of, um, you know, kind of useless. Um, but that's basically a two bay firehouse um, houses uh, an engine tank and a tanker at that firehouse um, and provides backup to the main stations um, as the apparatus uh, and call levels arise. Um, we recaptured the pond a few years ago um, to make a water source for that pond, which was a natural, which was a nice natural um, addition to the town, I should say. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a nice station, but years ago we had put in for a uh, a roof to do, um, to be done. And we pulled it out because I think there were some items that were done on, you know, the library was more important or something else was uh, a higher priority for uh, construction wise. So we pulled it out. And I think that was like a $65,000 project, but that still has the flat original roof from 1970s. Um, and we've done general maintenance, um, but, you know, the town staff has stretched to the very, uh, you know, thin bones of the of keeping up with all the facilities in town. So, you know, fortunate enough that it's been a low maintenance station, but um, that houses uh, this side of the town of uh, Garing Road, New Road and everything else wise. So our, our firehouses are really strategically placed throughout the community um, to benefit the community as far as insurance needs. Um, we did a we did a need study probably five to ten years ago that if we closed a firehouse, people don't realize that if you close a firehouse, um, it adds your insurance cost um, because the first question they ask when you buy a house in the community is where's the closest firehouse or water source. Um, so we did a space need study as far as that was concerned, and it was not beneficial to close the firehouse. Um, so. You know, that's one of the older stations that we'd like to look at and Chuck will get into the dynamics as far as um, rehabbing or uh, demolishing it. Um, he'll go into depth of as why is the cost benefit um, analysis of that, but um, it's a it's a perfect location close to the exit 67 area. It hits the highway, which we're always out on. Um, so that's station 340. And I think the next one is station 440, which um, Surprisingly or not, that was built in 1989. Um, it's a mimic of Station 340 and Garing Road. Plains Road is Station 440, which is off of Buff Cap Road, um, which was which was back in the day when it was put up. It was um, the community kind of was at a bare arms of saying why we put a firehouse up in Plains Road, but Settlers Way and you know Doe and Bucks and all that that development really took off, and that's when we put a a, a tanker up there and an engine tank in the past 20 years or so. Um, and in my capital budget, I had actually, uh, put in for another tanker, but I removed it because Stafford and Willington, um, and then Coventry got a tanker. So I removed that from the capital budget because we have close mutual aid partners, but keeping the, um, expansion of our apparatus, uh, what we do is station 340 on Garing Road and station 440 are, are satellite stations. So as we replace apparatus, we take the main line apparatus. Um, station 240 on 195 in the Crystal Lake Road Firehouse, and we cycle them out to the satellite stations, which provides a backup to apparatus when um, something's out of service, we can pull it back into the main firehouse, but at least it's always a, a piece of apparatus, always able to respond. Um, station 440 was really dormant for a few years because the volunteers um, staffing that have come and go uh, throughout the years but we used to house uh, a person during the daytime, but over the past years, our ambulance calls and medical calls have arisen um, dramatically. So mainly I, I house uh, the main two firehouses, station 240 and 195 in, in Chris Lake with the paid staff of the six guys I have. Um, because once you know an ambulance runs, the ambulance is your bread and butter of the community. Uh, that's what brings the, the money and the, the stuff into our uh, community. So like I said, station 440 doesn't look bad, but it's had a lot of water damage. It's a flat roof. Um, and Chuck will get into the dynamics of the engineering aspects of it. Um, but I don't need a Taj Mahal. I, I really need a, a meats and potatoes working factory. And that's why I've gone after um, the, the Morton type of buildings, um, which you'll see in your, I think, presentation. And um, 
I am more willing to share any of the photos um, of any of the firehouses or as well as open up the firehouses for any of the community or anybody to see um, what's in there as far as space needs or uh, working conditions. Station 440 on Plains Road was one of the firehouses back in, oh, five years ago, as well as the COVID times right now that if we were hit with something and I had to house people for COVID, I would house them up at that station and take that station offline. So, um, you know, it's got a, it's got a nice bathroom, uh, a shower and a kitchen, um, which is at least separated, but it's a mimic station of Garing Road. That, that firehouse was uh, built identical to the Garing Road firehouse, pretty much the same layout, uh, two bay firehouse, a kitchen, two bathrooms, and a couple small storage rooms um, and an office. So, um, like I said, Mike, as uh, all the slides of all the firehouses that you guys are more than welcome to go through. Um, but our dynamics of the community has um, changed over the last you know 10 years or so. But we've done back-to-back -back studies over the last 20 years. Um, and we're just trying to keep in line with uh, where we're going and where the community is going as far as the needs of uh, you know emergency services and uh, fire and ambulance protection and everything else wise. So you know one of the last dynamics that I've taken over in the last couple of years uh, you know, maybe the last 10 to 15 years after the storms of 2000, we created a CERT team, which is a community emergency responder team. And I've taken out a lot of resources and storage needs that um, we never anticipated for. So I'm trying to build out that as well, which I need storage space as well. That's one of the reasons I went off to the storage sheds as well as the rec center for extra storage so I can clear up some space um, because that's the backbone that's gonna back up the emergency areas. We have a great asset of community responders, about 40 members or so. Um, and those are the volunteer members that are keeping the COVID uh, testing sites as well as being backed up. But unfortunately with the COVID times, we haven't been able to meet face-to-face. -face. Uh, they've been do doing a lot of Zoom meetings throughout the weeks. Um, but like I said, as we move forward, um, it's one of the needs that I'm looking at is to at least bring our facilities and our, um, you know, our our meats and potatoes up to par to keep the uh, volunteers as well as the career staffing going um, as we move forward. Okay, and uh, thank you, John. And this is Mike. And I was going to turn the floor over to Chuck now. So uh, we're, we're fortunate that, like I said, Chuck Chuck Eaton um, has done the analysis and the scope of the work narrative. And, uh, and thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, Chuck, I have your um, memo here that you wrote to us. Would you like to maybe walk the council through it? Um, so, uh, like Mike said, uh, I'm Chuck, I'm the town engineer and, uh, you know, I've worked, I've worked for the town for, for quite some time now and, uh, work with John on many different fire station projects and that sort of thing. And so, uh, like, like Mike said, we're looking at station 140, uh, 340 and 440. So we're not, we're not considering 240. Um, and so essentially what we did for these three stations is we, you know, we, we brought together uh, architects and structural engineers and mechanical electrical engineers. And we went through the fire stations uh, and basically divided the, the needs of the town into two categories. Uh, you have maintenance and code items, and then you, ought, you have improvement items. Uh, and what we did is we went through and summed up all these different items and uh, including the, um, the foundation issues at station 140. And we, we categorized everything, kind of gave a basic summary of what the, the different issues were and uh, put together an estimated cost of, you know, rem remediation for the different issues. Um, and I don't, Mike and John, I don't know how in depth you want to go with this, but um, you know the, the everything is all summarized here in this memo. And essentially, what we did is we we looked at um, we looked at station 140. 140 is in is with the exception of the foundation, it's in good condition. So uh, there there are some code items and some space issues uh, that need to be updated. But essentially, we looked at fixing the foundation and um, you know doing doing the the the, the basic maintenance and uh, improvements to that building. 
and and that came out to be I believe about two point one million dollars or so. Um, and then the other two fire stations, three forty and four forty, we did the same thing. But the the issue with those buildings is that um, once you once you make all these these um, I don't necessarily want to call them upgrades, but once you once you fix all the different issues in the building, what's the cost between upgrading the building and raising, you know, versus raising the existing building and putting up a new building? Uh, the new building would be more energy efficient, um, and all of your mechanical, electrical, uh, everything everything would be new and up to current code. Um, Chuck, do you want me to share the spreadsheet on the screen so people can see that? Sure. Okay, hold on, everybody. I'm going to move down for 39. Okay, this is the spreadsheet that summarizes uh, all the stations. Yes. So on the, on the far left, you have station 140, uh, and that comes out to be about 2.1 million. And then 340, <clears throat> the um, the basic building rehab is figured to be about 1.2 million. And then if you move it down just a little bit, Mike, and then um, if we were to raise that building and put up a new structure, you're, you're probably looking at about a million. So, or 1.1 1, 1 .1 million. So it's actually less expensive to demo the existing building and put up a new building than it would be to go in and, and rehab everything. Uh, and the same goes for 440, you know, you're looking at about 1.1 mil, 1 .1 million for rehab. And then uh, the demo and construction of a new building, um, you're, you're also looking at about 1.1 million. So um, that's, a, that's a basic overview. Uh, and then we worked with Lisa to put together, you know, bonding costs and design costs and this sort of thing. Uh, and, and that's adding those three buildings together, uh, plus these other incidental costs, you're looking at, at 5 million. Um, and I think, I think that's, a, that's a pretty basic summary. You know, I'm happy to go into more in depth. Mm -hmm. um, I think Scott also wanted to add something. Sure. Yeah, I just I just wanted to jump in here. Um, a few years ago, an old crumbling foundation thing started. <clears throat> um, we utilized an engineering service off of the uh, uh, Krog approved list. We did core testing out at Station 140. There's definitely pyrotite present. Nobody, even to today, will tell you exactly what the percentage is where the, the building is unsafe. We also hired another engineer to come out and on a monthly basis, they were shooting elevations off of these pyramids that were mounted to the building to see if there was any movement just so we knew it was safe for uh, the apparatus and, the, you know, and all of the uh, uh, firemen that are in there. There was minimal movement, but again, to echo what John had said and Chuck, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the same with Mr. Rosen, it doesn't make any sense to put this kind of money into a building if we don't address the base of the building. The, um, when this whole thing started, we took some money that had been set aside. I believe it was in the neighborhood of 20 or $30,000. And we had the wetlands delineated we had um, the septic tank and the leaching fields delineated. And the problem that uh, John and the fire department have is they have very limited space for adding on to you know, such as 340. If you look at 340, the leaching field is to the left-hand side of it. This, the uh, uh, septic tank is right in the parking lot. So we had to take all these things into consideration and um, in my previous employment, we had, we had looked at Morton buildings. And when John started mentioning those, I, you know, I wouldn't want anybody to uh, have the uh, misconception that it's just this big, ugly steel building. There, there are companies, the one we were dealing with, 
is, uh, you know, the rep is out of Massachusetts and they have some pretty nice looking yeah. buildings. I'd like to, Scott, maybe while you're talking, I'd like to show some pictures of what they sure. look like. So, um, and I'll let you keep talking, but we have some yep. samples of what Morton buildings look like here. And, and it, yeah. it, it, again, it's not like, uh, like John said, he's not looking for a Taj Mahal, but um, when it came time, you, the, the bottom line is if we put all this money and effort into uh, renovating what's there, we still have the old building, the old foundation. This, this is, you know, the ground up um, brand new and it's going to more than likely outlive me and, you know, quite a few other people. And it's, it's something that's uh, deserved. You got these volunteers who do just that. They come in, they volunteer their time to help protect all the citizens. And they deserve to have uh, uh, an area where, you know, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've been in station 440 and out in the apparatus bay is where, like John said, is their kitchen area, if you will. And there are more chocolate shots in the drawers than um, one would think after, you know, and that's from the little guys running around with the four feet and that long tail. So it's, it's not a real uh, clean place. And it's, it's difficult for them to, to maintain it because there's so many openings, the door with all the doors and, and what have you. And a new building would just be that much more energy efficient um user friendly for everybody and you know it, it's been a long time coming we've been working on this for quite some time right so um i just want to maybe wrap up our initial presentation and, and hold on everybody i'm going to scroll up again um so thank you to everybody who kind of spoke and presented um what what chuck and his firm did was sort of respond to the needs of what um was proposed and suggested by all of the stakeholders that are going to be utilizing the all these fire stations. And if we do end up funding this project, it's going to require um, a question on the referendum, which is May 4th, 2021, is going to be, you know, with everything hopefully uh, COVID behind us at that point, or at least on the ropes, we'll have a referendum this year, hopefully. And, uh, and in that case, we need to sort of backdate, backtrack and figure out when we start have, you know, get the information out to have this question on the referendum. So this is why we wanted to do the first look tonight, even though it's still, you know, December of 2020, but it's going to be real quick before we get to May. So um, we're, we're going to, here's the timeline here, you know, starting in March, we have to start doing some uh, work here and recommending to the council that we that we do this project. Um, there's a public hearing involved. Uh, there's authorization that's granted. Uh, this timeline, by the way, was um, prepared by our uh, bond bond council, so bond attorneys. So this is in line with what's required for referendum. And then we have to publicize. Um, you know, we have to after ten days after the passage by the council, we have to publish it in the newspaper that we're gonna have a referendum. Um, the PZC may wanna weigh in on it. Um, I don't believe it's a must, but it's probably a good idea that they do weigh in. Uh, there's also, we need to put out materials, notice of referendum that's gotta get published in the paper and flyers also go out to the voters. So there's a lot of steps that go into um, making this project work. And we wanted to first sort of workshop it here tonight uh, I'm sure council may have some initial questions and maybe we can try to hit a few of them tonight, but obviously this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, this isn't the end of the conversation. So maybe it's a good time now to stop and uh, let's see what kind of questions you might have while everybody's in the room here. Okay, councilors, uh, Steve has his hand up. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Steve. Yeah, sure, thanks Steve Jones. So, so thank you, Scott, Chief Lightell, Mike, Chuck, for all your presentations and information. You know, I think it was, I want to say January 18th, or it was somewhere around that time that was when we did this, you know, we're all bright, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to really see the issues that were at hand with these fire stations. And it was very evident that a lot of them were kind of decades in their lifespan and well overdue for renovation and replacement. So um, I'm definitely in favor of trying to get through this process as efficiently and effectively as possible to provide, you know, our volunteers and our paid town staff modern, clean, safe, and effective buildings to, to service the public. Um, 
in terms of the two stations, uh, the older stations, stations, I think, uh, I just look at the numbers, but um, 1975, 1989, for in terms of building date, what is the average lifespan, either if Chief Lytell or Chuck could answer, what's the average lifespan that you find with most fire stations in kind of this New England area that have been built within the past 30 to 40 years? John, do you want to answer that? So I don't know if I'm the expert to say it, um, but it just seems um, that throughout the budget process, if this is a fair statement or not, um, we've had so many capital needs throughout the last 20 years or so. There's been some higher priorities um, that needed to be addressed. Um, if you look back in the 2006 council minutes, um, we you're just getting the debt of the high school that need to be replaced and, and rebuilt. So a lot of the projects just got pushed out. Um, so some of our maintenance needs and some of our other issues might have been just put behind us. Um, we've done a great job of trying to um, put band-aids on a project, but um, in general, um, you know, I'm you know, not saying I'm surprised with the 1998 uh, Station 440 Plains Road, but you know, that's where. You know, when you come up to standards, standards changed throughout the last 10, 15 years. And we're looking at standards of, you know, we're running diesel apparatus. We're running, you know, different types of things where the guys rinse off the apparatus. Those stations weren't built with the proper drainage. So when you talk about the drainage and then you talk about the heating supply, you know, station 440, we went to a propane versus a, an oil heat. So, you know, we're, we're at different sides. And then Talon is a very... I'm um, not saying this negatively, and I'm not the expert, believe me. Um, but when you look at uh, um, the way Talon's built, I don't think anyone can disagree with me as far as the way the soil sediment is in Talon, as far as your water system, as far as your oil needs. So, you know, we've had a lot of issues as far as like Scott has done um, a phenomenal need, but I think we just lost our heating system again a month ago or so. so Scott had a you know, pull more money out of his facilities to fix the heater or it's station 140. It's a newer station and we've already replaced the boiler over there twice. Um, but that's a, something where that rock and that sediment is over there. Um, so like I said, I'm not the engineer, I'm not the um, community expert, but as you look at your different sediment throughout the community, um, we've had some issues with the stations. Station 240, we've put a Band-Aid on it. And, and as far as that station, that's back in that 1973. If you look at the slides and the presentation, I don't know if uh, Mr. Rosen has shared with you. I'm more than happy to share with you the slides, but I think there was something on our Talent Alert Twitter page that went out in the last two weeks or so, as far as like the old history stuff that we've been trying to advertise. That started off at a two bay firehouse. We've added on, the volunteers built it. We've added on a, you know, additional, we had to start getting um, air cascade systems because of a new requirement. So it seems Seems like unfortunately we get um, the arrow through us of saying, "Oh, you got to come up to needs. Yeah, you got to meet this standard." So as far as the needs and everything else wise, um, we've done pretty good over the last 50, 60 years. And as we move forth, the last thing I want to do um, after I leave uh, after twenty twenty one and resign and retire and and move on and, and move to Florida is to have firehouses in the community that aren't going to you know sustain the next 20, 30, 40 years. So trying to make sure that uh, the sites that we have in the community are great. We have not addressed, and, and we did a space needs on, like Chuck said, station 240 in the training center. We're leaving that alone right now until it comes economic that we're feasible to make a good decision to, to move that location or rehab that location years down the road or whenever. Um, but as of right now, it, it's all to a point where, like um, Scott said, we're, we're gridlocked in a little cubicle where we're stuck in a box and we're trying to maintain what we have. So. Um, unfortunately, over the 2006, and we did a facility study back in 2010 and put everything into a, a, a ball in the community, and we've addressed everything else, and we're at the last uh, tail end of the dog. So we're at the point now as, you know, and unfortunately, my luck as it has it, we're in a COVID times. And I'm not going to say that this is all going to be over when it comes time for May or June because we'll be COVID free. Um, who knows what's going on with this new strand of COVID, which I'm nervous as ever. But um, good decisions tonight on your part to keep a lot of the funding um, stable because who knows what's going to pop up in two months or three months. So um, as we move forward, I'm at the tail end. And, and if we have to push it off, but as you push it off, we're not doing the improvements or the maintenance, those 
items like Chuck, right? Am I wrong by saying the roof and the deterioration is just going to um, increase farther? And unfortunately, I, I see on the um, on the screen tonight my fire marshals um, online. Thank God the building inspectors not, but um, I would hate to close a firehouse in a town to say, um, you know, we have a code issue, we have a violation issue. Um, I've been very fortunate with the staff that works with us and, and whether it's volunteer or career that they have not pushed the issue. Um, we've gotten the, the asbestos out of the firehouses. They have not complained about the um, health and safety needs of the firehouses. They may do with what they got. And they're very appreciative of everything that the community and everybody gives to us as far as the apparatus and equipment that we have. So um, it's hard to say, Steve, if that answers your question. It's just um, four sites are different. So, so, you know, I think John did a, a pretty good job of summing up the, the stations and the specific needs, you know, of Tolland itself. Uh, but in general, you know what you you had a you had a, a vast change in equipment, um, John. What in like the in say like two thousand and you know similar to like you know all the all the requirements for PPE and everything have changed. You know the 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 vehicle you know the the fire equipment has changed as well, and so the way they use the trucks and everything has really changed and. It, they've really gone, you know, the old days, you know, you see the guys like pulling the hoses off the back of the trucks and all this sort of thing. It was a much more linear type of um, vehicle usage. And there was, there was, you know, you had, you had kind of like doors that would open on the sides of the trucks and this sort of thing. Well, the, the equipment now has, they, they utilize the sides of the trucks much, much differently. And they have rolling drawers and those drawers can, can pull out on either side of the truck. In other words, it's, it's like one drawer and it comes, it can come extend out on either side. Um, and the equipment has gotten much larger. Um, and so with, with that, the, the storage facility, facilities needed for that has also had to change. So you, you see a big difference um, from these, was it 20th century fire stations versus the 21st century. So you, you'll see like some of those pictures that Mike had up before, you know, the bays and everything are much, much larger to accommodate the way, you know, the different features that, that these vehicles have now. So you need a lot more side to side room as well as the vehicles are longer so you need, um, you know, front front to back room as well. Um, so you'll see a lot of these fire stations getting expanded where they can, or they get reconstructed um, to to provide that additional space. Um, the the stations in town here, those three forty and four forty, just to, you know, from from what John said. You know the the maintenance on those has really been deferred. Um, not that that would necessarily have helped us now, um, because it, it it a lot of it is a space issue when you come down to it. But for instance, those you know 340 and 440, those have the original roofs on the on those stations, um, and those are 20 year roofs. Um, so you have a 1975 station with a 20 year roof on it. So um, those roofs are in really bad condition and they're, they're leaking um, and, they're, and they're causing the buildings to deteriorate further. Um, so, in, you know, and of course that goes with everything, the, the, the heating and, and plumbing and, and ADA accessibility and all that sort of thing. So um, d does that kind of help answer your question, Steve? So, you know, the, the stations built before 2000, you see a lot of those getting remodeled uh, basically for space issues, um, which is kind of a separate issue as opposed to, um, you know, a maintenance issue. No, it, it definitely does. And it helps expound upon the fact that rebuilding is not only financially beneficial for the community if it passes at referendum, but logistically it's beneficial for for the new equipment and the way that firefighters and the equipment and our key infrastructure operate within those buildings so I, I do appreciate that um just trying to kind of reverse engineer the whole process of of this referendum and, and approval you know would this replacement of buildings at least for the for the two older facilities 
would we be considering this to be a multi-year process or a phased in approach perhaps, or is that too far along in the conversation to really map out, you know, what impacts might need to be considered to certain stations and certain regions of the town being serviced, you know, thinking of if the Plains Road is being shut down to be rebuilt, you know, is it the stations at Mara Road that are responding to calls out on Old Stafford or Buff Cap? Or is it another station or are we utilizing more mutual aid during those times of um, restructuring and rebuilding? Right, so, so it would be all of the above. So we, John and I did talk about this. It probably would be a multi-year um, project because you would have to have a, you know, one station would have to remain in operation while the other station is essentially shut down and gets rebuilt. Um, so you have to have a place to store the equipment uh, and, a, and a, a base to work from, um, you know, while you're working on the other stations. Steve, I appreciate it. Hopefully. Oh, so go ahead, Chief. Just to highlight what you exactly said, when we had the issue at Station 240, we had unfortunately had to use uh, Mr. Lappin's garage at the highway department to store one or two apparatus um, back when we had some bay damage at one of the firehouses. So, I mean, our goal from the fire service side would be to go after Station 140 as the primary um, because then we would have the adequate space to shut one of the other stations down. But the bad thing is, yeah, we would have to um, change our mutual aid um, to make sure that first level responders are uh, hitting this, you know, the Plains Road, Buff Cap Road area first. Um, people don't realize from station 240 in the middle of the night at one o'clock in the morning, it's a 14 minute ride um, for someone to get down to the firehouse and then travel all the way across town. So we would, we would you know, um, advocate to go after that station first. Um, and, and, you know, the hence reason is that we don't know where this community is going to go in the next five to 10 years. If you look at the summit fire 2020, I encourage everyone to look at the fire summit, um, 2021, uh, study that's being done nationally, the volunteerism, um, of a lot of communities are, are, are having a hard time recruiting people. Will we see a um, an input of a 24 seven operation of this community. I think down the road, you're going to see at least some supplemental staffing to try to increase uh, staffing to cover the first initial, second initial calls. Um, and the problem is we don't have the proper adequate um, uh, sleeping quarters. Um, we haven't had someone file any complaints yet, but um, I can't let a female and a male sleep in the, you know, the bunk room at station 240. Um, you know, it's something that we have to look at as far as separation and ha having the proper adequate sleeping quarters or holdover quarters. Um, right now you have, you have staffing that when a hurricane comes or a storm happens, they're sleeping in the apparatus bay on cots. Um, so that's what we're trying to look forward to the, for uh, to the forecast, if that makes sense. No, it definitely makes sense. And it sounds like the approval for the Steve grant is also going to be beneficial Huge. if this project goes forward without much issue that that can be utilized as a secondary source of storage while buildings are being re-evaluated, rebuilt and restructured. So I appreciate that. Um, one other question I had, trying to find the page, it was the 20% contingency. I'm guessing that's a question for Chuck, what, what that entails in terms of the 20% um, factor in that cost. Sure. So <clears throat> while we did the best we could with um, putting these costs together, you know, we we haven't done this is kind of like a, a high level summary of a fire station program. So this is this is not the full program. And what what a program means is you essentially look at the needs of the town look at the look at what the building provides and and take a look you know map out what is missing and what needs to be added so in the end uh, you have a full report of exactly what needs to be done to that building to meet the needs of the town and so this is so what we've done so far is basically put together kind of like a narrative of you know what we've what we've looked at so far and um, so once we, once we move past this point, uh, we, you get into a much more detailed program, uh, which will help, uh, finalize these numbers or, or more accurately depict these numbers. 
Um, so we wanted to make sure that, you know, because this was kind of somewhat preliminary right now, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we had sufficient contingency in there if, if things change a little bit. No, I appreciate that. I, I assume that a lot of the contingency would be based on, you know, market value changes for steel and other costs, you know, I think that's, that's definitely been a fluctuating factor in the rebuilding of Birch Grove. So I assume that would be a, a similar factor to rebuilding the steel frames for, for fire stations. Um, I think that about covers my questions. I think the only other one that I'm sure most counselors have in mind is, um, are, are we aware of any town or state grants or state or federal grants, I should say, that assist in helping rebuild or demolish and rebuild new fire stations? Generally, obviously bonding, you know, we're saying the total projected cost is 5 million, but in obviously with past projects, whether it's the library expansion or other projects, we, we bond for a certain amount and then we find ways to help try and whittle that down by finding state opportunities like STEEP or other grants that can uh, mitigate that total debt being um, loaded onto our uh, obligations in future years. So Steve, if I could just answer that. Um if you guys don't mind. Um, there is the firefighter assistance grant. Um, I just recruited a brand new uh, grant writer uh, that retired from a um, division. So we're gonna try to pursue looking at, now that we have a solid plan, um, to see if there's some possibly way of uh, pursuing some money uh, to offset. Who knows, we might get you know the, the cost covered 100%. I don't know, but we're pursuing those avenues right now. The problem with Tallinn is, as you saw, we wrote over the last four to five years with our air, air packs. And unfortunately, because our median income of the community, we, we've gotten cut back every single year. We've made it to the final round and then we get yeah. stuck. So, you know, we just spent $460,000 on air packs. Um, and I've tried over the last, you know, what, four years to try to get that. The last time we got that was 20 years ago. So we are pursuing that aspect. Um, maybe we'll have a shot and I'm, I'm throwing the dice on the carpet with the crumbling foundation. Um, I'm going to try to, you know, pull that straw to try to say maybe that will help us. I don't, I don't know, but we're, we are pursuing that aspect as, as at least from the fire department end. Um, I can well, also okay. try to I definitely. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say I can try to piggyback on that too. So um, I think what we would what we would uh, be asking council to consider as we go through this process would be to similar how we did with Birch Grove to authorize the debt up to five million dollars, but to be offset by any state aid or other um, funding sources that we can avail ourselves to. So um, you know I don't think Steep will be available by this you know coming year. We'll see where that goes. Um, but obviously this would be something that we, we could try to apply for a steep grant in the future. Um, and then also I was made aware of uh, a state bond bill, which might be able to help offset um, local, uh, local assets or local capital assets. And I, I believe our, you know, maybe our state rep might be able to tell us more about that. But, uh, but just in, in general, like there, we're going to look at other funding sources where we're available. Um, as we go through this, but we wanted um, Chuck and everybody else to hammer down the dollar amount so we know what we're up against. No, I appreciate that. And then just anecdotally from uh, Chief Lightell's perspective about the volunteer um, issue, I know I was, I was helping with um, Chairman Powell at uh, the COVID testing recently, and I think it was either Jim or, or uh, CJ kind of started chatting with me and trying to pull me in to become another volunteer because it sounds like they're looking to to rotate some of the the uh, old guard out and get some some young blood in there to help uh really manage things so i think definitely getting another push out there to make sure that you know the next generation that moves in the town and invests itself maybe steps up to volunteer helps make these fire stations not, not only accessible and, and and feasible but also well staffed by invested residents so I, I, that sums up for my questions and comments and um, I'll, I'll pass it along. I've probably spoken too long, so <laughs> thank you. Um, I can confirm that your new state rep has already started conversations to find out what bonding opportunities may be available. So, and also we'll be working with John to understand any grant opportunities that are out there and anything that we can um, push for this. So, um, Brenda. Hi, thank you. Um, Brenda Felucci, Steve, you did a great job ask, asking most of my questions. I appreciate it. Um, and to Chuck and um, Chief Vitale, thank you for all your answers so far. 
Um, am I right in assuming that um, having new buildings will help increase the, the life um, of our equipment and apparatus that we have stored at these locations? If I yeah. can, uh, yeah. I, I would say definitely on that. Sorry, Chuck. Um, we, we try to, um, if you if you if you look at our apparatus, we, we're very fortunate that Scott was very proactive of putting a wash bay and uh, planning for the wash bay at the highway garage. We try to take use of that. But, you know, when we're out at 10 o'clock, one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, um, my guys try to rinse the apparatus. And if you look at our apparatus that are already, I mean, my oldest apparatus on the road is 33 years old. We try to push the uh, the level, and I know some of my guys uh, that are in a meeting tonight get mad at me, but you know when you're running a 30 year old apparatus, uh, we try to push it to the limit. So we will do everything in our power um, to have that because if they have the more space and the more uh, adequate facilities, I think that you'll see um, they already take a vested in, in, in interest into the apparatus and, and the equipment. So we'll do everything yes. in our power. Yes, I, I've seen that both on your side and. Um, for public works, they, you guys do a great job extending the life wherever possible, and that's appreciated. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor at this moment of moving forward with new buildings because it, it will help extend the life, make it easier for you guys to do that, um, free up some of your time maybe to do some other things. Um, the last question I had um, was, are you going to be used if you do demo? some buildings, will you be taking the opportunity to use that as a training exercise, if you know what I mean? Um, uh, you know, a fire, you know, light up the old building for a demo so that you guys can get some practice. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna stay employed for another 10 years, so I don't wanna burn my own firehouse down, but- um, no, I mean, Once it's approved, if it's approved to get demolished and then use it as a training exercise you know just if thinking that you don't have to answer that if you don't want to right now no but if there's any way um my guys are so mad at me that um and i, I think kate murray's still on the phone but um my guys were very extremely mad at me that i didn't take the opportunity to have some live exercises at birch grove um one, in, as far as tactical training with the uh, state police and doing active shooter training in the school, and as well as doing forcible entry and doing some um, serious overhaul. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunately, the times have changed where we have to be so careful of doing live exercises because of injuries and everything else wise. And then the problem is, is the dynamics of the paperwork. Um, you know, like Chuck said, the years of the past have, have passed because when we used to burn houses down, the dynamics of the paperwork just to uh, do a live burn has just, um, it's sometimes not cost beneficial, if you know what I mean. I get it. It was just, I was just oh, curious. I, I think we'll take advantage of anything that we can do as far as um, we don't get an opportunity because if, you know, say I had a, a, a hurricane structural collapse at Big Y, we have all the trenching and uh, storage equipment. We don't have the opportunity to, to really use those tools in a real, uh, serious situation. So whatever we can work with the contractors uh, as we move forward, we would obviously take the, um, you know, the, the chance to do that. But that's a great question. Yes. So, um, and thank you. And thank you to everybody that I see on here, uh, all the volunteers and staff um, from, you know, the fire department, um, really appreciate your dedication to the town. Thank you. Um, Lou. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first off, uh, Chief Lytel, when you submit those retirement papers, they're going to be denied, so don't plan on going. <laughs> um, Sorry, and, uh, that's when that's when John goes from paid to volunteer. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know his wife. I will hide if that happens. <laughs> and uh, and moreover, I mean, having been a, a volunteer firefighter uh, over in Bloomfield uh, for a number of years, and coming to see here and town and the facilities, uh, I'm. Uh, amazed at, at how efficient and effective the fire, uh, the fire department here is, uh, that you guys are truly uh, skilled in what you do. And so uh, my hat is off to all of you for uh, the outstanding job that you do. That being said, um, that I would be interested in seeing what, uh, what you have as proposals going forward um, and getting, uh, you know, this is a good initial discussion, uh, but I'd like to see a little bit more, another nuts and bolts, bolts as far as uh, what the proposal would be 
as far as for the new buildings and what you what structures you would be looking for and uh, to make sure that it meets the needs not just currently uh, but going uh, moving forward in the future I mean as as everyone has said so far the buildings that were built you know uh, decades ago met the needs at the time but really weren't aren't sufficient for what we have right now and if we are going to go forward and moving uh, and and uh, build these new buildings, I'd like to make sure that they're something that meet our needs now, but also will be able to meet our needs in the future, uh, including the birthing, including the, uh, the, uh, the galley area, um, all of that. I'd like to see all of that included, uh, but I want to make sure that we uh, also uh, make it as a, uh, a cost-effective building as well. Uh, so, but thank you all for, uh, for everything that you presented. I think this is a great initial uh, start to, uh, to, uh, to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay. So John, I'm I have two questions. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that Kate Murray's still on and maybe she'll take over the firehouse project after she gets done with the Birch Grove project. <laughs> <laughs> so John, um, I have a few questions. Um, First one, I noticed in all of the new stations that we're adding bays. So um, can you explain a little bit about why we're adding bays is the assumption that we're gonna have to add new apparatus um, or by extending the bays at 140, we're gonna have the ability to put more trucks in there. So why are we adding bays on all of the, the new fire stations? So, so basically a perfect example is um, after the snowstorm uh, that we just had, um, my guys actually bring out the apparatus during the daytime and bring in the stuff that's outside, whether it's the service trucks or the trailers. Uh, a perfect example, um, just hashing out and every time I speak, my guys get mad at me because it usually ends up happening again. Um, about two years ago, we had the back-to-back -back tra trailer accidents and we had to use the trailer uh, that is in a parking lot of the training center. Um, that's a perfect example that we try to, we try to house the stuff in there in an emergency need. So um, keeping a trailer or keeping the outside equipment that we have outside right now will expand the life. So that emergency services trailer that you see in the training center parking lot, that's a $20,000 trailer that has probably about $10,000 worth of equipment in it. Um, but that really saved the firefighters um, two years ago when we had the uh, tractor trailer chicken fire um, because we were cycling person, personnel out of that uh, because that has portable heaters in it um, as a rehab unit. So, you know, every time we get a snowstorm, we got to bring the units inside, remove all the snow from the top of the roofs, get it back in service and then put it back outside. I can't store the stuff in there. So, you know, at middle of the night, one o'clock in the morning, when we have something like that for an incident, it takes me another 10 to 15, 20 minutes to bring everything out of the station and put in there. The game plan for station 240 right now is since we got the storage units, I have over 50 to $60,000 of PPE, uh, firefighter equipment and bunker gear that's gonna go into the storage sheds. And then down the road, I'm gonna pull a permit to put electrical into those storage uh, garages. But as we move this expansion onto the firehouses, when you talk about $60,000 of fire PPE gear that is open to mice and everything else, I'm losing five to $10,000 every couple of years because the stuff gets deteriorated, ripped apart, or mice get into it. So as we move our expansions out, I'll have the proper adequate storage spaces to store that stuff um, to maintain its life. Um, as far as the, uh, the bays, I can't, like Chuck said, all the apparatus nowadays are coming out to where we're trying to meet the ergonomics of the society of roll out trays, pull out cabinets. It's not like the old days when you just had one small cabinet. The stuff goes from one side of the truck to the next. Um, so during the day when the guys do the daily checks, a lot of times if it's 32 degrees out, they're doing the daily checks inside with the exhaust system, but they're going through all the equipment, running all the apparatus, going through all the miscellaneous equipment. Every single air pack, every single piece of equipment checked weekly. Um, Right now, sometimes you'll see the ladder truck or other things outside because they don't have the space to open up all the doors or pull the stuff out to go through it. So that's one of the biggest things, if that makes sense. So how many um, how many additional bays would we be adding to what we currently have? We're trying to add a bay to station 340, a bay to station 440, 
and then as well as rehabbing uh, the office spaces, the bathrooms. Right now, nobody can take a shower at Station 340 on Garing Road. Station 240's showers are off that are closed. They've, they've been closed for 20 something years. There's only one sh uh, two showers at the training center that the guys come over during the daytime um, if they get contaminated or anything else. Station 140 only has one bathroom um, or two bathrooms and a shower and a shower. So we're trying to expand the showers and the bathroom areas of those firehouses. Um, so we'd like to have adequate showers at all the firehouses. So that's one of the other avenues. So two, we're just going to be adding two additional bays then in total. Two additional bays. One on each, one on each, one on each house, 340. Yep. In station 140, if you look at it, um, I can't put, Today, station 240, we had a fire tonight. My luck, this is going to happen to me. But I have not done what? Oh, my dog's in the park now. Say station 240 had a fire tonight. I had to move the apparatus around. I can't put the ladder truck over at station 140 and put a fire truck behind it because of the length of the ladder truck. I can't put them back to back. Mm -hmm. So yep. you'll have space in between where we'll be able to put some of the service vehicles or another apparatus behind each one. So there'll be true apparatus back to back bays. Okay. So I'm just um, expanding that footprint of that firehouse. Okay. Uh, Lisa, this one is for you. Uh, if this is a phased project um, and this process goes over a, a, a year or two years, what does that mean for the bonding? Is this something that we've got figured into the bonding uh, plan as, as you guys have developed so far that is before us in the five-year uh, capital plan? Yes, um, I did phase it in over a couple of years. I, the whole five million is not in the first year. I don't have the plan in front of me, but it was included in okay. the uh, projections. So this is not going to cause a spike anywhere in um, in bonding or need for for tax increase. Although there'll always be some sort of um, impact on the debt. So had it not been there, it's certainly, you know, you wouldn't have as much debt. So to say a spike, mm, it, it added a couple million dollars the way I had to push it out, but we tried to spread it out so that the impact would not be quite as bad. Does that help? No. Lisa, I can also <laughs> add, I can add to that too. I just will let, let everybody know that. So don't forget, we had projected at one point the debt was going to be three million. So that's what Lisa had been carrying for several years on the books yeah. in her debt plan. Now, when we had heard that this might go above three million, we our initial estimate was four point three. Uh, so we layered that into the debt plan, but when it came out to be $5 million, um, dollar, you know, five, 5 million, it was the extra 700,000 that we had to account for from 4.3 to five. So in a way we had already kind of accounted for at least three, if not 4.3 million of the five. So Lisa's already done a very good job of starting to layer all of that in, in her modeling. Okay. Again, it's, you know, with the way we do it, we try to put it in where other debt is falling off to try to lessen. That was, yeah, that was my big, my biggest question. Are we looking for where it's coming off? And so we're not gonna, like, we know we're seeing a spike for Birch Grove. We know taxes, you know, the expected hit is gonna be X amount of years. I, I'm just looking to see that we're not um, gonna see another additional spike for, um, for this if we don't have to, if we can manage to work it in when other stuff is dropping off. That's what we try to do the best we can. Okay. Um, and then John, you had mentioned this very briefly. So my last question is around um, the thoughts of mo moving the training center. I know there's issues over there with size and capacity in the training center. So I noticed this is not wrapped into it anywhere. And there have been some discussions, a couple of points in time about 140 and using that there. And then I've also heard conversations around um, the possibility of, of changing the location of the training center and making it bigger. So can you give us a little bit of uh, insight into the whys or why nots for this? So real short, um, I think our oldest member that's on tonight is Carl Dogen. Um, he goes back in the, uh, the horse time. But um, 
back in the day, the Leonard's Corners Firehouse over in Crystal Lake Road. He's laughing as he puts his hand to his chin. But Leonard's I love that one. It's right down the road. It's so cute. <laughs> Leonard's Corners Firehouse uh, was built uh, with assistance of Box back in the time. But when this, when the town did a study back in the day, they wanted to keep the central firehouse located in the center of town. So. Mm -hmm. They built the fire department uh, over at Station 140 and did not replace the uh, training room. That's when they took Cumberland Farms by Inman Domain. That used to be the Cumberland Farms, Kent Pizza, and yep. I believe an insurance company. And they built on the footprint of that um, concrete existing pad. So basically, we just put up a shell um, that was there, which was very fortunate. Um, the fire department. Fire Department Corporation outfitted the interior of that building um, by donations of the community and businesses. And Station 240 has been there since 1973, Carl, correct me if I'm wrong or not. Um, but we added bay to bay to bay. Um, we've looked at different sites um, back when the um, planning and zoning looked at the 195 quarter study. We were, they were looking at putting a satellite firehouse up there. We also looked at several pieces of property. I would love to take a piece of property um, that we were hoping to get from the BB property because I would love to have a quick access to I-84. Um, that would make a lot of sense for the community, but um, that didn't work out. And that's when Chuck and I um, first had breakfast way back in the day. And, uh, we did a, a, a station assessment need. Uh, I think Chuck can kind of dwell on it, but we did a space uh, as far as a training center and station 240. Um, but we've been looking um, all the way across the board where the last piece was, we looked at uh, North Coventry's firehouse and route 31 and 44 out that way, um, because that's what they were looking at. But, you know, I think we're in a needs where I think Mr. Rosen, when he came here, we even looked at a piece of property on 74 uh, to relocate the firehouse as well. So we, we understand that the commercial property at 195 is a, uh, a valuable asset to the community. Um, and I know a, a couple of uh, businesses were interested in it before, but I think the town and now that we have a, uh, a great new town manager um, and economic wise that we're looking at saying, you know, what's the best needs of the community. We're unfortunately in a COVID time right now where, you know, sales and different things are hard and it's going to take a businesses a year to two years to get back on their feet. But as we move forward, it's good. The town's going to make a decision whether to sell off that property and relocate us. Um, off the record, if I had it my way, we would have took over Parker School and made that the public safety complex and put the you know bays up on the uh, fields up there and had a you know in and out. But um, we even looked at one time um, the property at the highway garage um, because they were talked to move the highway garage. I, I don't know if this was before your time, Scott, or not, but move the move the facility up at Cross Farms. So we looked at the Cross Farms land that was up there. The problem with the Cross Farms land is coming down Rhodes Road. So we looked at several pieces of property throughout the town um, and there's nothing that really spikes a, a great quick interest or a trade-off sale because I think that's what the biggest bang for the community is to sell off the property and then use that money to replace the training center and station 240 um, to kind of call it like a, 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 an equal break if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, Lou? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just uh, a quick question for uh, Lisa here um, is, Lisa, when you were looking at this uh, and uh, the bonding issue, was this going to be one bond um, or was this gonna be something that was split over two separate bonds? I mean, just, you know, cause I, it wasn't really clear when you were talking about it, uh, or I guess I just didn't understand it clearly. It was split over two separate. Um... I have to go back to look at our plan. I may have had notes and then put it into one. I have to go back to the plan and look at it. But I know it was split over. We wouldn't issue all the cash at once. There was going to be about three million in one year and another two million in another year. But for, for us uh, to do that, that would require two separate public hearings and two separate referendums to approve the bonds. Then. Oh, that... oh, oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question. The referendum would be for the whole $5 million. But when it comes time to issue the debt for the cash flow, I don't have to issue all the debt at one time. We base it out on what we think the, the uh, timing is of, of the project. So if we wait a year 
to do part of it, then we're not issuing the whole $5 million in year one. We'll issue what cash we need in that year. And it depends on where it falls in our plan. Um, we may issue notes and then bond the entire part um, with the second year piece in the second year. Okay, uh, thank you for that clarification. I just, that's what I understood, but I just wanted to make sure that it was, that it was clear. So, all right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hey, does anybody else have any other questions? So, um, Mike, I'm assuming we're going to review this again before the whole capital budget process at some point. So this is again, a good first read for all of us. And if everybody wants to go through in more detail, spend some time, if you've got some over the holiday break going over and I'm sure if anybody wants a, uh, a tour or to go back and look at any of these stations again to kind of visualize what we're talking about here, I am fairly confident that um, John can make that happen for anybody. And just to note also that so the way this works is this project is built into our capital plan so we'll be hearing about it if not sooner than February then at minimal February but we'll, pro we'll probably try to get it on another agenda if it makes sense to try to you know get ahead of the, the capital budget public hearing. Um, to do at least one more read of this and answer some more questions, but this will go through our capital process, but when we're going through and, and our budget process, but it will be a standalone project at referendum. Yep. Okay. Anybody? John? John? So I know in the past, the uh, other projects in the community has done um, community educating. Is the council or anybody looking for me to do any type of open houses? Um, we've done them before, but obviously we're under COVID restrictions, so it's kind of harder now. Um, but I'm more than willing to share my PowerPoint presentations of the stations. I don't know if that would be helpful for people to see a, a bird's eye view. I mean, pictures are worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I can share those with you, but obviously educating people are the, is the biggest thing because, you know, when you don't see it, you know, go in it, um, you don't know. Um, but like you said, I, I'd make myself available um, or any of my staff would. Um, the problem is that the fire department and public safety get hit restrictions from year after year. And Carl had just texted me, um, one of the newer initiatives that came out um, is the cancer restrictions that um, we're facing right now as far as um, exposures and um, distancing and everything else wise, which is really inhibiting uh, as far as washing gear and keeping things separate. Um, so that's one of the other aspects that we're trying to go after uh, as far as the space needs. But um, like I said, the, the firehouses are open and the I want the community to know it anytime Monday through Friday that anybody can stop by and look at them. Um, we're approachable. Um, stop down, look at them, take a site. Um, you know, Monday nights, the guys train, but if that's, it can be anything that can be pushed out from the, uh, town management and staff, just so they can view it, look at it. Um, you know, the community has really come together over the last six to eight months between, uh, all of our services. Um, and I just think that they need to see it. So whatever we can do. So I just throw that out to you guys. Thank you. Um, I think we do have to be very cautious in COVID times, but maybe we could set something up if people make appointments. Um, or something like that to come down and see it. Yeah. Maybe Mike, we can we can talk about that. Yeah, I was gonna say we can make a, a landing page on the town website that's dedicated to this project and put yeah. pictures up and stuff. And we yeah, can definitely yeah, do yeah, some. Yeah, we can yeah. definitely do some Zoom meetings to um, as like a, a community forum education kind of thing. Yeah, I was gonna add. Obviously, probably COVID has impacted it, but you know the touch of truck events usually happen in a major parking lot but having community ones where it's like a neighborhood touch a truck event or something that's more socially distanced and could be practiced well and maybe the cert volunteers could be utilized to help with traffic flow could could bring more people within those neighborhoods to the fire stations that directly service them um, might be might be a, a good avenue all right if nobody else has anything john i uh thank you guys again for coming uh, you guys can drop off if you don't want to stay on for the rest of the meeting. If you do drop off, um, happy holidays. Thank you for coming. Yeah, best of luck with the storm this uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, too. I just got the uh, Eversource alert for that, that they're expecting some power outage potential. 
Mr. Rosen gave the fire department uh, a happy holiday as he gave us the week off. <laughs> <laughs> We're calling in mutual aid, right, John? <laughs> it's a retirement gift, right? Yeah. <laughs> stop, stop with the retirement talk. <laughs> All right, uh, that gets us up to 8-5. Consideration of a resolution to authorize the town manager or designee to apply for FEMA and State of Connecticut COVID relief funds. Mike. Okay. Yes, I will uh, do my best on this one and I might need some help from Lisa. So uh, we recently learned, this is what the agenda item says here, but we recently learned that, you know, pursuant to the federal rules for the coronavirus uh, relief funds, CRF, not to be confused with the Board of Ed CRF we talked about earlier, but um, we, the, the, the state is applying to the federal government for these funds and they're also um, sort of in a way sponsoring the local governments. This, we're applying up to the feds through the state. That's probably the best way to explain it. And um, council needs to approve our application for our, uh, our, our piece of the pie. Um, so we already had a, a first round of reimbursement that we deposited into the declaration fund. Um, and the idea being that um, these funds would go up to pay for expenditures related to COVID-19. Um, and as you all know, we did not get 25% from FEMA uh, for reimbursement. So this, these funds would also go towards that, uh, the 25% that, that FEMA did not cover. Um, but basically what, what this agenda item is asking for the, uh, the money that we are getting Tolland is getting from the state that we have authorization to apply for these funds so that we can designate them towards expenditures that were incurred due to COVID-19. I think, Lisa, did I cover that? I mean, maybe you can kind of give a little bit more light to that. I think you pretty much covered it. It's just to, um, as part of the application process, um, the council has to bless the town applying for it. Um, it's sort of after the fact. So um, we yeah. were not aware that we had to apply, have council approve us applying for those funds. So we've already applied and received and those funds were um, to reimburse the 25% share that FEMA did not cover as well as some other items that FEMA did not cover at all, which were 100% reimbursement. Um, so this is just the, when we spoke with the state as to a lot of people not understanding that we had to do that, they said that we could probably just go back retroactive to put the blessing on that we applied for it. The other thing too, is that there's a, a, a pretty soon deadline of December 30th, where yeah. all these funds need to be expended by December 30th. So they, and I, we just found that out last week. So we're, what we're doing is we're applying the, the funds that were being allocated towards previous expenditures that have already been incurred, uh, such as the FEMA, the 25% that was not reimbursed through FEMA, plus um, various salary line items for uh, emergency personnel, public safety, DPW, overtime, things like that. So um, we're, we're going to be able to make the deadline by the end of the calendar year. I just wanted to make sure we mentioned that we're going to make that deadline. Um, just so you know, if you've been watching the federal package, if that actually gets approved by the president that extends the CARES um, spending deadline to 12-31-2021, I believe. So if it goes through, um, that might push it out. But anybody else have, anybody have any questions? Well, I'm all in favor for you guys applying for aid. Even though you've already applied for the aid and gotten the aid, I'm all in favor of you guys applying for aid. <laughs> if there's no other uh, discussion, then uh, Steve. All right, uh, I'm Ch Chairman Nucci. I'd entertain a motion that be it resolved by the Town Town Council that hereby approves as follows consideration of resolution authorizing the town manager or his designee to apply for FEMA and CRF funds from the state of Connecticut for COVID relief reimbursements pursuant to federal regulations. The CRF funds are through December 30th, 2020. If the program should be extended, then this approval will be expended for any such periods in the future, approved by the Town Town Council on December 22nd, 2020. This is Brenda Felicia, second. Any discussion? 
All right, all those in favor? Brenda? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. I have an eye, so that passes unanimously. Thank you. 8.6, discussion and possible consideration of extending the 12-14-2020 resolution to approve a tax deferment program pursuant to, the govern to Governor Lamont's Executive Order 2027-S and Executive Order 2029-R guidance. Yes, uh, so it's April 14th, 2020. We, uh, we so all first right. of all, Mike, Mike Rosen, town manager. So this, this item was added to the agenda due to guidance that we received um, pretty much towards the end of last week. Um, so a bit of good news and uh, potential relief for, for those folks in Tallinn that were impacted by COVID-19. So let's take a step back and maybe talk a little history here. So back in April, 2020, Governor Lamont issued Executive Order 7S, S as in Sam, which allowed uh, local legislative bodies to have the authority to uh, consider and adopt um, one or both of programs that um, were eligible at the time. One was uh, a, a tax deferral program, which deferred tax payments for the, that, that the July tax cycle by 90 days. The deadline, it deferred the deadline, not the tax itself. So the tax, it was, uh, they still were, you know, people still needed to pay their tax. Uh, the other was a low interest rate program. And at the time, the Tallinn Town Council um, opted to go with the deferment program. There was a sort of a laundry list of reasons why the finance director and I recommended that we go that route. Um, it was, um, I think it was seemingly effective. We, we have some stats we can share about how the first round of it went. But um, the, the, this, this new executive order 9R uh, if, essentially extends the program, the tax deferment program for another tax cycle meaning that for the January tax bills, which would normally be due in February 1st, or the first week of February, it would be pushed out to the first week of April instead, thereby giving it 90 days from its initial deadline of January. Um, or it, the way I think of it is actually it's 60 days from the day that the tax bill is due. So if it was gonna be due the first week of February, now it's due the first week of April. And if you don't, uh, or sorry, if you, if you don't pay your taxes by the, the new deadline, you will be hit with um, all of the interest that occur occurring all the way back to the original uh, deadline, which was January 1st. So uh, the idea is that we, by deferring people's taxes a couple of months, it gives them some more time to financially figure out their their households and their and their plans and you know uh, obviously again it's it's still it is going to be due if this is not a forgiveness program it's just a deferral program but it gives you some more time to um you know just kind of sort out this whole coronavirus pandemic um and i'm going to look up in my email i have an email from the collector that said how many people uh opted into this program the first time around so if you give me a second i'll find that i don't know if lisa you wanted to add anything no, I, I really have nothing else to add. I think it was about 18 people. And, uh, but she'll have, she'll have, you'll have the results in that email that she sent. Yes. Um, so we did have 18 applicants. Uh, 16 of those applicants did pay within the new established deadline. Uh, two ended up paying late. Um, so they did have to, they did face that interest, unfortunately, but that's the way the program was set up. Uh, but the total tax deferred from those 18 people was about $62,000, but we did like, again, 16 of them paid that back timely. So we, we had, um, 18 applicants is not an overwhelming number. It didn't affect our cash flow or anything, but we uh, we just want to get the word out now. And in fact, as part of your packet tonight, we have a draft press release already drafted uh, if, upon your approval. Or actually, uh, I'll get to this in a second. You don't have to you don't have to take a vote tonight if you're going to just extend it. But um, upon your blessing of this, we're going to put the press release out starting tomorrow and and hit social media. Um, I also um, spoke, we're going to put a press release out. So they'll go to the local papers. Uh, one of our reporters from the Journal Inquirer uh, mentioned that there's interest in doing a story on this. So it's going to have a, a wider, you know, breadth of, um, 
uh, people hearing this information. And um, just on the point that I was making a moment ago, uh, if Tallinn decides to utilize the same program that we did for the April time period, uh, we actually do not need to have a vote tonight to extend. It's anticipated that all municipalities will automatically extend what they did in the previous tax cycle. The only vote would be if we wanted to amend anything that we did in the previous tax cycle. That, that, that's what I've got, thank you. So at this point, do we need a straw poll? Well, um, certainly discussion. If anybody wants to say whether or not they'd like to continue the program as is, um, a straw poll wouldn't hurt. I'm just saying we, we, we don't need to formally take a vote tonight. Certainly, if you want to, that's fine too. Well, yeah, I, I think um, we'll definitely have a little discussion here and then I get a gauge of what people are doing, what I think for um, purposes of the record and that we can just do a straw poll at the end. So the intent of the conversation is really for us to discuss, do we want to continue with the same plan that we offered back in April, which is congruent with the executive orders as given by the governor, which did not mandate the plan, but it available. If we say yes, then we stay with the same option that we had last time, which is, as Mike said, the deferral. Um, and then people can take advantage of that. We didn't have a lot of people who took advantage of it in the spring, but I do think that we may see more now in the fall, especially with the continued unemployment and the continued impact that we're seeing on small business. So um, we may have more, uh, I would at least think we may, it's a possibility. So anybody have anything they wanna say? I'm in favor of extending it just, you know, outright. I think that's just from a straw poll level, I'm in favor of continuing you know, what we're doing for both consistency's sake as well as um, the uncertainty that we have over the next probably four to six months of uh, rolling out vaccines and distribution and, and inoculation, so. Okay. As well as general state policies and what the state legislature and government's going to do for assistance and the new federal stimulus, uh, what impact that's going to have for state government and local government. Okay, I have you down as in favor. Uh, Lou. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, based upon uh, everything that we've discussed uh, previously uh, when we were first considering this, as well as uh, what we've seen develop, uh, I, I concur with Steve's assessment on that. And I would uh, I would be in favor of, uh, of extending. Uh, that's that's my input. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, I'm just going to uh, echo uh, everyone else's sentiment. I'm in favor of sending it. It's a minimal impact to this town, and if you can help somebody out, I'm all for it. Okay. Uh, Brenda? Um, I'm in favor, especially for those 18 people we helped. Um, you know, to have tax bills now three months away from each other is a little close. This allows them to plan a little bit longer. So um, I would expect them to take advantage of it at least. Um, and again, maybe more people. So, yes. Done. Thank you. Uh, I'm for it as well. And I'm happy we, we were able to help some people and hopefully we'll be able to help some more. So I'm for it. Okay. And then last but not least is me. And I am definitely in favor of, um, of extending the option. And Mike, I am very much in favor of making sure that we have this advertised um, so people are aware of it and businesses are aware of it also. So um, if you'll do an e-blast or anything also, that would be, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, we're planning on doing this starting actually tomorrow and, uh, and people just, they, they do need to apply um, mm -hmm. for this. So they have to just note that they've been impacted by COVID-19, but that's a very loose uh, statement. You know, within a way, we've all been impacted by COVID-19 in, in some way, shape or form. Yeah. All right. Then straw poll is uh, unanimous. Uh, eight uh, seven, right? So we're on now. Yeah, eight seven appointments to vacancies on various municipal boards and commissions. Uh, we did have one um, um, planning and zoning, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Mark uh, Mark Farrell from PZC, uh, alternate Democrat, has resigned from PZC and is looking to be replaced. I have the paperwork here, sorry. <laughs> um, by Jason Philbin. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to read the paperwork here. <laughs> Jason Philbin <laughs> will be taking the alternate spot. Uh, 
there you go. Well, I'd like to thank Mark. He's a he's a great guy and he's done a lot of work there in his time as alternate. And um, I've appreciated his voice on planning and zoning. Um, he will be sorely missed. And Jason, welcome. You have some really big shoes to fill there. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, Mark was a was a great fair fair minded guy. I really I really enjoyed what he did there. So Jason, welcome. I see you're still on. Can I um, just a little note? There's a typo on um, the appointment. It says 122321. That should say 122320 for his term to 11921. I don't want him to miss his term <laughs> on a technicality. <laughs> And again, I want to echo um, Mark Farrell did um, was on the planning and zoning as an alternate for three years and he was there during the um, development of the uh, POCD, the plan of, of conservation development with Kurt and um, great job there. So thank you and very much looking forward to having uh, Jason on and did we lose Jason? No, nope, he's there. Okay. Oh, there he is. He took his, <laughs> he I see him in person now instead of the background. So thank you, Jason. We're, I'm very happy to see that you've stepped up for the uh, alternate position. You'll be a great asset to the town. Thank you. Steve? I'll just continue with the echoing, you know, thank you to, to Jason for stepping up and engaging and being an alternate. Um, I will just add as, a, as an aside that uh, Mark didn't stray too far away. Uh, Bob Rubino as the Conservation Corps head quickly lassoed him in. I was in gonna to say, did he swoop him up? <laughs> He, he, yes, he did. And he will be the uh, steward for the WANET property. So um, oh, that was one thing I forgot to mention is that we did have a WANET subcommittee meeting and we invited Mr. Farrell to help be a part of the um, four phase approach to developing the WANET uh, senior park and conservation area. So he, he's, a, he's literally right across the street from it. So, um, and he's a very avid and interested resident in terms of the stargazing events. So, you know, you'll be on the lookout for probably more similar events on the WANET property. Uh, in that aspect and and he's also a CERT member so he's continuing his volunteership as a member of that group. I'm glad he'll still be involved. All right um so what do we have we have to uh, we should make a motion so that yeah. we can note note the proper uh term please. Yeah so Steve Jones will entertain a motion to appoint Jason Philbin of 11 Harvest Lane to the Planning and Zoning Commission alternate position for a term of 12, 23, 2020 to 11, 9, 2021. This is Brenda, a second. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor, uh, Brenda? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. I'm an aye, so that is unanimous. Welcome, Jason, and thank you to Mark. Um, okay, that gets us to nine. No old business, we have none. 10 is a report. Okay, uh, good evening. I'm going to keep it pretty brief tonight, just in light of the hour and, and everything. So first of all, I just wanted to start off by saying happy holidays to everybody. Uh, just want to echo, I'm sure you've heard from your state and federal folks that, you know, be safe this holiday season, uh, stay close to home if you can, or just, you know, proper social distance and everything. We, sh we don't want to see another spike like we did after Thanksgiving uh, in town as, as, you know, as much as possible. Um, the other thing I kind of wanted to mention is that tomorrow evening, um, there is a special meeting that's being hosted by the town, but uh, with in conjunction with Eversource. Um, it's uh, this, the, the topic is um, solutions to help with your energy bill. Uh, it's basically Eversource is going to put on a presentation at six o'clock using the Zoom platform to talk to folks about um, you know, ways that they can perhaps uh, save money on their bills or if they um, perhaps are uh, eligible for programs that Eversource runs for either income-based or uh, there's a slew of other things, but they're gonna get into it. Um, our, our Eversource community liaison, Jonathan Ferrigno, is going to be there and several members from his team. Um, Bev and I actually sat in on a dry run of it about a week ago. It's very interesting material. So if I'm putting a little bit of a plug in, it's because I think it's useful for people to hear because it might be another way for everyone to save money out there. So that's very important at this time. Um, I know Bev had reached out through her network as well to let them know 
that um, this program is being held. So tomorrow at six o'clock, the information, the Zoom link is on the town website on the town calendar, um, solutions to help with your energy bill. Um, that's really the only advertisement I had for tonight. Uh, happy holidays. Thank you. Uh, it gets us to 11, adoption of minutes. All right, Steve Jones, I didn't train a motion to adopt the minutes as laid out in 11.1. This is Brenda Felucci, I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, Brenda? Aye. Uh, sorry, Cassandra's not here. Steve? Aye. Uh, John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. I'm an aye, so that passes unanimous. Um, as Mike said in, uh, let's see, number 12, correspondence to council. Hi, this is Brenda Flusi. We had, uh, I believe, seven emails in support of declaring racism as a public health emergency and creating a proclamation. Um, there were some other emails. Most of them were invitations to programs, Zoom meetings, educational forums, things like that. So that was it. OK, thank you very much. Uh, gets the chairperson's report and I am going to um, echo Mike tonight and I don't really have a whole lot on my uh, agenda other than um, people try to stay safe, um, take care of yourselves, make sure you're, you're doing everything that you can, that we don't see any spikes um, and have a happy joyous holiday season for those of you who celebrated Hanukkah. I hope you had a great a great holiday and um, let's hope for a peaceful end of this year. And if anybody wants to join me at midnight on New Year's Eve and yelling Jumanji, I'm hoping that the game is over. <laughs> um, let's see, that gets us to 14, communications and petitions from council persons. Uh, Lou. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, that uh, I just wanted to address some of the issues that were uh, brought up earlier uh, regarding uh, you, Madam Chair, staying on in your position. Uh, that I think that uh, as a, a town, that we are fortunate to have you as uh, both our chair as well as also our uh, representative. That I think that there is a basis for uh, for you to continue on, uh, where we do have other representatives across the state, including uh, right next door in Vernon with Dan Champagne being uh, both a uh, state senator, as well as uh, remaining on as the mayor of Vernon in his capacity. So I think that there is a basis for it. I think that we are fortunate to have you in both positions. And uh, I, uh, I would uh, just wanted to put that on the record that, uh, that I think that uh, we are uh, lucky to have you and that I, I, that I would hope that you continue on uh, in both positions. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Um, Brenda? Uh, yes, um, I a couple things. First, um, I was wondering if we, we were going to be doing an update on where we stand on our goals. I asked for that a couple months ago. We historically do do that, I think, or at least um, we've done that the past few years. Mm -hmm. um, I also ask for an update on um, outstanding petitions that we've asked for over the past year. If anybody's asked for something to be considered and it hasn't hit the agenda yet, um, an update on when we can expect those things to hit agendas or at least be open for discussion. And the last thing is I will, um, since I did receive a number of emails, um, both to the town council as a whole and a lot of texts and, and phone calls and emails personally, I would like us to um, just have a discussion about racism as a public health emergency. I cannot speak as eloquently as um, Lucas has done, but um, he's made some uh, excellent points. We received lots of educational material and um, articles and research in support of why this is beneficial. We would be joining 18 other towns in at least um, three states, plus numerous other towns and cities and other states that have done this. Um, our residents are reaching out to us and asking us to do this. And I believe that it's time we stepped up to the plate and started making um, some changes so to end racism as a public health emergency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brenda, you mentioned you, um, you asked for 
uh, an update on where we stand for our goals. And I know that Mike and I have talked about that getting on an upcoming agenda. You also mentioned you requested an update on outstanding petitions. Did Who did you send that request to? I'm asking now it's for an update on oh. everybody's previous okay. um, commissions or uh, petitions, sorry. Okay. Joking on water. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, all right, Mike, I know I have a, a list on on my minutes that I keep. Um, do you have an ongoing list too? We can sit down and talk about that. Um, I don't keep a list of that, but like you said, I, my first thought was to go to the minutes and see what yeah. what was there. And I've got I've got all of them on my on my thing here. I take minutes in every meeting, so um, I can go through and look. I think we've had I think we've dealt with the majority of them, but I'm not 100 percent sure. So we'll have to go back. I know we haven't because there's a number of them that I've asked for that have not made it uh, open for discussion. So. I will go back and look, and then um, we will work on agenda updates. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, the public health declaration. I will look at it and see, on it from the agenda perspective, when we can when we can get to it. Um, and Steve. Yeah, Steve Jones here. Um, I, I wanted to first kind of discuss whether or not just to make a petition to the council, whether or not we want to have a timekeeper for our public participation, being mindful and respectful of, you know, how limited we have in our public participation, but also just maybe at the two minute mark, just say, just making sure that we kind of utilize that similar to the Board of Education. So it's a, a seamless process, but also encouraging residents to send in their correspondence or speak at the end of a meeting if if they do feel like they didn't get enough time to speak on a topic. Um, I know it is very rare that we do shorten people's um, public participation and there was a little bit of back and forth at the beginning of the meeting. So I would appreciate um, if someone's willing to step up, if not, I'm willing to step up to be a timekeeper and have a timer to say, you know, at the two minute mark, just respectfully indicate that, you know, it's a two minute limit. And if you're able to summarize it or would like to stay on and speak further at the second opportunity that that's afforded to every resident in town. Thank you. I, um, I'm not opposed to that, although uh, they have Tony the timer. Uh, you know, that's their running thing. I, you know, I don't know if Steve the timer is gonna, you know, it doesn't have quite the same ring, but. Um, it, it would probably be Steve the stopwatch. No. <laughs> the stopwatch. There, see, there we go. We have to have like yeah, the little. A little, a little bit of levity. Um, and then second, I, I, I wanted to bring this up. I, I spoke to a few people before raising this to the council. I wanted to just for the record, make note of the passing of a, a very legendary resident in town who passed away on the 18th, um, Robert Noonan, who served as a selectman in the town and as a board of ed member, um, you know, a World War II vet who served on, you know, land sweep or minesweepers in the Pacific you know, half his fleet got taken by a typhoon, you know, it was taken very tragically and very suddenly from us due to COVID in the past week. So just from me personally, I, I'm sure other council members would agree that, you know, we thank you for your service. You know, we honor you and we're, we're very saddened by your loss and give condolences to the family, to someone who really did a lot in terms of shaping Tolland for many, many years. And uh, I'm sure even you, Chair Minuccio, knew him from the, the senior center and his engagement, his, uh, his, his feisty Irish uh, sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, us Irish, we tend to like find each other. <laughs> but he's, he's a great guy. I'm very sad to see, to hear about that. Thank you for but bringing that, that up. And um, I, I echo your, your sentiments. Um, does anybody else have anything? Okay. Um, Let's see, that gets us to communications. No nope. public listed participation. Any subject within the jurisdiction of the town council, three minute limit. If you are on the yeah, device and you'd like to raise your blue hand, um, if you are on a phone, you can hit star nine and that will raise your hand. Just a quick okay. question. Do we have Steve the stopwatch starting now then? <laughs> yeah, I suppose so, <laughs> right? If, um, if, uh, if you do get, if you do raise it, if you do deign to speak, you will have to state your name and address for the record. But I don't, oh, there you go. Liz. Um, hi, Liz Costa, 54 Josiah Lane. I just wanted to thank Steve for uh, recognizing Mr. Noonan um, as a, a early resident of Tolland. 
um, I grew up with the Noonans and the entire family of eight children. Didn't know, don't know all the grandchildren, but certainly know the eight children and Mrs. Noonan. And he made a lifelong impact on, you know, on everyone in Holland. So many people, I, a friend of mine said she met him at, at Crandall's just walking with her son um, recently. And that was just amazing. And not to mention he was a teacher and a counselor and, you know, on the board of selectmen and the board of education and just a wonderful human being. Um, I think his daughter aptly described him as a legend and I would encourage you to create a proclamation um, on his behalf for his family as well as the town. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I was, I was thinking that, but if you would like to um, formally suggest that, we can bring it up at, the, at a council meeting. I think I just did, didn't I? Well, I think we have to do it via email, correct, Mike? A, correct, thank you. There's a format um, through the town website where, uh, because basically we need some of the wording and I think Liz you could, and whoever else, there's some great wording there that you all just provided. So we'd have to, you know, through through the website, through that, um, that email process. box, it, you can put all the information in and we can generate a proclamation. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, and I'm heartened to hear it too. I think Liz, you may have mentioned it to me that um, the family's already reaching out to Bruce and the town about in installing a memorial bench at Crandall's for, for Mr. Noon. And so that, that'll be a great other um, form of symbol, symbol to his dedication and his uh, lasting legacy in town. Yeah, he. T I'm just gonna add, I know it's uh, I'm out of turn, but he also touched Little League and all sorts of other things. The Historical Society literally was involved with everything. And obviously, Tammy, I know you knew him from the Senior Center um, and probably dozens, if not hundreds and hundreds of people knew him from Big Y, if nothing else. Yeah, we're a small town at the core of it. You know, I think we all, and when you have somebody who's that involved in your community, people know them. So um, I, I think it's great that if they do a memorial, a bench or something like that, I think that'd be wonderful. And uh, again, uh, please, if, if you um, need help with the form or anything, reach out and I, I would love to see that um, be submitted. And have a good holiday, Liz. Uh, Jason. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what everyone said. First of all, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to join the PZC as an alternate. Uh, I agree, Tammy, I do have some big shoes to fill with Mark. Luckily, he said he's still available for text for any questions I have. Um, and I'd like to wish to everybody on the council and uh, Mike a happy holidays and a happy new year. Uh, I hope 2021 is epic, unlike 2020. Thank you. You're welcome. Jumanji at midnight, Jumanji. <laughs> okay, uh, anybody else? No, all right then, that brings us to... Oops. See, uh, Chief Lightell's uh, hand is up. I don't know if he, he his, wanted to speak. His finger I, thing, John. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm out of it. Um, so first and foremost, I, I truly appreciate all the council and the community um, coming together. And uh, we've been through some devastating times. Um, I apologize for losing some of the staff tonight. We actually had another death tonight in town. Um, so I lost some staff tonight and we've been through some dramatic times, but um, hopefully uh, we'll get through this together as a community. And I can't thank enough my staff and the support of the community. Um, we're hopeful times will get better. Um, we have a new senior center director coming on board soon and um, the outpouring of the sharing of the press releases with everything else with the toy drive, the food donations um, has been overwhelming. And this community um, stands above a lot of other communities. Um, so I, I can't, I'm, it's, it's, I'm not gonna lie to you, my Christmas tree is not fully decorated. It just doesn't seem like it is, like it is past years and, um, you know, with all the COVID testing going on and the COVID vaccines, um, you know, essential employees got bumped today uh, or the other day. I think Mike Rosen sent out an email to some of us. Um, it's just, uh, we need to stay strong together as a community to get through this. And um, I'm, I'm hopeful that things will get better. And 
it's been emotional, a very, very um, emotional time. There's been, there's been some things that have happened over the last week or two that I can't say because of HIPAA, but there's some others that have been dramatically affected over the last week or so. And um, I think you're going to see it come out in the next week or two that um, some close um, other staff members or uh, volunteers on our commissions that have been affected by this um, COVID stuff. Um, but, you know, thank you for the council, the board of education and everybody. It's just, uh, if we can just uh, stay stronger for a little longer and work together. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, on behalf of myself and my staff and the town staff and the school boards. Um, we we got to get through this together. Um, so I, I, I hope for a better year. So Merry, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, what everybody celebrates uh, together. Um, I'm hoping that the, the fire truck at least brought some cheer to the community going through the community. Um, and on behalf of the fire department and the human services and the toy collections and the food donations, we cannot thank the community enough. The outpouring this year here was um, was dramatic. I mean, I just got off the phone about three hours ago with a with a mother that's a they got a 21, 20 year old son that lost her job since March. Um, that has nothing, and um, she will have a Christmas. Uh, Tomorrow morning, thank you to the community and my staff and everybody together. She will she will have a Christmas um, and a holiday um, come this weekend. So um, I apologize for any uh, hard times and everything that I've done or anything else. But um, hopefully, we can start a new year together. So I, I appreciate everybody's support and hard work, um, and God bless all. Thank you, John. Um, I, I can speak for myself in saying you guys have always brought a little bit of uh, light and levity to the, the holiday. And um, I took great pride in the fact that even through all of this, you guys were able to carry on with our tradition and um, knowing how the fire parade started and all of that this year made it even more poignant. Um, it was nice to just see Santa in the truck, you know, so I thank you guys for, for doing what you guys do because um, it's, it's a lot. And thank you for sticking on in the call. And, um, and with that, I think, uh, I think Steve. Yeah, if there's no other holy participation, I entertain a motion to adjourn at 10.32 PM. Brenda Move the oh. uh, any discussion? Nope. Okay. All those in favor? Uh, Brenda? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. I'm an aye, so that's unanimous. Thank you guys all. I hope everybody has a great holiday season um, and the rest of the year. I hope to uh, see you guys all.